since the fall of Atlantis, Satan and his minions have been working tirelessly to end all goodness on this planet. But God and the Brotherhood of Light have put together their own plan to defeat the dark side. Throughout history, many prophets have come forth to speak of the coming golden age of humanity. This truth was made known only to fall silent on the deaf ears of the ignorant masses, but change is on the horizon. By the time of the Renaissance, humanity had begun to rise from its slumber. Slowly, mysticism and superstition began to be replaced with science and logic. It is here 400 years ago, at the height of Tudor England, where this story begins. A secret marriage was arranged between Queen Elizabeth I and Sir Robert Dudley. Due to Dudley's political ambitions, the Queen chose to maintain her virgin queen status. From this marriage came forth Francis Bacon, who was raised by an adopted family. At the age of 15, while his parents were arguing, he overheard the truth, that he was the future heir of the King of England. All his life, the Queen kept dangling in front of him the mantle of power. To be or not to be, that was his question. Alas, it was not to be. In 1603, Queen Elizabeth appointed King James VI of Scotland to be her successor. Instead of letting this defeat him, Francis chose to rise above his circumstances in the pursuit of scholarly and political interests. He had the King James Bible translated. He wrote the Shakespearean sonnets. He persuaded King James I to charter Newfoundland and was an officer in the Virginia Company. He was King James's Lord Chancellor, and he fathered deductive reasoning, which set the grounds for science and technology to liberate humanity. Secretly, he was a master of the alchemical sciences and the occult. It was here that he began to remember his past lives as the Prophet Samuel, Plato, St. Joseph, Merlin, Roger Bacon, and Christopher Columbus. When he was the Prophet Samuel, he helped liberate the children of Abraham from the bondage of corrupt priests and the Philistines. In the 5th century, while Europe was falling into the Dark Ages, he returned again as Merlin to help King Arthur establish Britain into a stronghold against ignorance and superstition, a place where Christ's achievement could flower and devotion to the One Source could prosper in the quest for the Holy Grail. It was later in the 19th century when his efforts blossomed when the United Kingdom became a place where industry and individual initiative could thrive as never before in 12,000 years. As a medieval alchemist Roger Bacon, he predicted the invention of a hot air balloon, a flying machine, a magnifying glass, and mechanically propelled ships and carriages, and amazingly, he wrote of them as if he had actually had seen them. He believed true knowledge stems not from the authority of others, nor from a blind allegiance to antiquated dogmas, but instead is a highly personal experience, a light that is communicated only to the innermost privacy of the individual through the impartial channels of all knowledge and of all thought. Because of the heretical nature of these beliefs, the church imprisoned him where he remained for his final years. In his Opus Magis, he wrote of a voyage of three ships and a discovery of a new world. The sea between the end of Spain on the west and the beginning of India on the east is navigable in a very few days if the wind is favorable. In his next life as Christopher Columbus, he was inspired by these words, and along with a prophecy made by Isaiah, he knew a new world would be found whereby God would recover the remnant of his people, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Isaiah 11:12. When Francis Bacon became conscious of these incarnations, he sought those hidden treasures he placed away until his rebirth. At the age of 12, Francis conceived of a time when mankind would go through a period of great restoration. In 1620, he placed this vision for humanity in his book, The Great Instauration, in which he formalized how to change the whole wide world through the restoration of true knowledge after centuries of obscurity and neglect. It was here that he first devised a scientific method that ultimately launched a new English renaissance. 
Many of his ideas were kept in the shroud of secret societies in order to hide from the prying eyes of church officials. With help from his brother Anthony and some friends who were students at Gray's Inn Law School, they created a secret society known as the Knights of the Helmet. They chose this name from the goddess Athena, who was depicted as wearing Pelé's helmet of invisibility and carrying a golden spear of knowledge. The goddess Athena brings about wisdom, intellect, and the moral side of human life. Athena's helmet of invisibility represents her silent war against ignorance and sloth. The knights of the helmet also consider themselves invisible warriors against ignorance and sloth, as they secretly worked to expand the English language by creating new literatures not written in Latin, but instead in words all Englishmen could understand, such as found within the King James Bible. In 1611, the King James edition of the Bible was commissioned in order to unite the Anglican and Puritan church leaders. After a long series of edits by nondescript translators, the final draft was handed to King James, who then passed it on to Francis Bacon so that he could revise the Bible into a marvelous piece of literary work which is still being used today. Many of these works were written anonymously under pen names such as William Shakespeare. Francis chose this name because the goddess Athena was known to carry a golden spear of knowledge, which she would use to strike at the serpent of ignorance. When sunlight would strike her spear, it was known to tremble, thus the people would say she was shaking her spear again, hence the word Shakespeare. In a symbolic gesture, Francis would shake his pen as a spear of knowledge to slay the dragons of foolishness. Written within the Shakespearean plays is a hidden cipher which shows Francis Bacon not only as a true heir of the King of England, but also of Queen Elizabeth's secret marriage to the Earl of Leicester and her preceding two sons. For upon his birth, Francis Bacon was given over to Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne, who pleaded with the Queen for the life of the child. Queen Elizabeth rejected her son because she feared her subjects would choose a male heir over herself to rule the kingdom. Some historical documents hint of the secret marriage and her two children, such as found within this portrait. However, any talk of this during the time of Queen Elizabeth would have resulted in imprisonment or death. After a happy childhood spent with Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne, on his 12th birthday, he was enrolled in Cambridge University. Mysteriously, Queen Elizabeth provided the funds for his education. At the age of 15, he discovered the true identity of his royal blood, so Queen Elizabeth sent Francis abroad to France, placing him at a comfortable distance from her throne. While in France, he studied cipher codes to learn new ways to protect confidential information in England, and he also worked with Masonic secret societies which sought to reform the French language. Three years later, upon his return to England, he brought back these same ideas and created a secret society known as the Knights of the Helmet, which through their literary works would ultimately modernize the English language by standardizing the spelling of words. The Knights of the Helmet was part of a larger movement of secret societies found within Rosicrucian teachings, which dated back to the time of Atlantis. The Rosicrucians were a loose-knit group of secret societies which believed knowledge or wisdom was eternal and should be freely available to those who seek it. Just like with the Knights of the Helmet, the Rosicruce Secret Society was also part of this movement. The Rosicruce is shorthand for the Society of the Golden and Rosy Cross, which was founded in 1571 to protect Queen Elizabeth after she was excommunicated by the Pope. And secretly, they sought to bring about universal enlightenment through the use of the alchemical process. The Golden Cross symbolized the transmutation of the base elements into spiritual light. The Red Cross symbolized the heraldic color of the metal gold. These colors were often associated with St. George and Archangel Michael. And the rose symbolized the heart of the cross, where one could find love, intelligence, and enlightenment within the human soul. Just like with Athena's Helmet of Invisibility, members of the Rosicruce would make silent oaths under the principle of sub rosa or beneath the rose. They believed it was best to be discreet and conceal some things while revealing others in order to create a treasure trail to those who seek truth. And as Athena would shake her spear at the snakes of ignorance, so could St. George shake his spear at the dragons of ice. 
members of these societies understood that if an individual could be a powerful force of change, so could they, in larger numbers, slay the dragons of the world. It was here, as a member of the Rosicrucian Secret Society, that Francis Bacon became inspired to write his famous Great Instauration, which would restore paradise on earth through knowledge and virtue. In addition to the Rosicrucian and the Knights of the Helmet Secret Societies was the Freemason Secret Society whose members passed down the secrets of building the massive cathedrals and castles of Europe. After the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603, King James succeeded to the throne. During his reign, Francis was promoted to Viscount St. Albans and Lord Chancellor, which was the highest positions of power one could obtain in that era other than the king himself. He was given the task to reform Freemasonry, which in late Elizabethan England was more of a social clique for the elite. He sought to change operative Freemasonry of the medieval stone guilds into speculative Freemasonry, that is, a fraternal order of philosophers that would create the world as God made it and not as men or the church made it, a place where religious and political strife could be placed aside under its three great Masonic principles of brotherly love, relief of the poor, and seekers of truth. He then redrafted the nine degrees of the Knights of Templar into 33 degrees, which became the basis of modern-day Freemasonry. Many of these initiations were based on Christian ethics, with a focus on the realization of one's own inner Christ consciousness. Francis chose 33 initiations of Freemasonry from a simple Elizabethan cipher, which equaled to the numerical value of his signature. By assigning a number for each letter of the alphabet, the name Bacon equals to 33. Continuing his mission that he first begun as Christopher Columbus, he persuaded King James to sign the Virginia Charter, which began the colonization of the New World with England's first permanent colony at Jamestown. Here, his Masonic teachings of inner divine potential, freedom, and enlightenment spread, which later resulted in the creation of the United States of America under its Masonic founding fathers. In his book, The New Atlantis, he foretold of the Pacific Island, where science prevailed over ignorance and superstition. This island had no rulers, but instead, a learned council of men who had proven themselves through scientific achievement. He envisioned the New World as this New Atlantis, a place where freedom and peace would reign under a Masonic order without despotic rulers trying to control their fellow men a place where the heritage of the House of Solomon could once again prosper under a golden age culture of science and logic. By 1620, his literary fame and political success had begun to spread, which created much jealousy amongst his fellow members of parliament. Eventually, they accused him of corruption, which was later proven unjust. After falling from public grace, he continued his work secretly reforming the Rosicrucian mystery schools and Masonic fraternities. His motto of one lives best by the hidden life describes him perfectly as his efforts continue to secretly influence humanity. Francis once said, the great end of life is not knowledge but action. True to his word, in 1626 he faked his own philosopher's death and attended his funeral in disguise with another body in the coffin. He then traveled to the Rakotsi Mansion in the Carpathian Mountain region of Transylvania, which is now located in modern-day Romania. Here, during the reign of Ferenic Rakotsi I, he continued his studies of alchemy, preparing him for his physical ascension under the watchful eye of Master R, who worked with the great divine director. After making two million right decisions, spanning hundreds of thousands of years of incarnations, he was granted ascension. The highest form of alchemy is not the transmutation of the base elements into gold, but instead, the transmutation of the soul into oneness with the Creator. On May 1, 1684, he finally mastered these secrets and ascended into the 14th dimension, transmuting his mortal body into an immortal angel conquering death itself. After the ascension process occurs, normally a soul would choose to move on to serve in higher dimensions. However, Francis chose to join the Great White Brotherhood of Light, who are souls that have vowed to stick with the earth until the day all humanity could ascend. These so-called ascended masters rarely interact with humanity, but Francis chose a different path. 
he wanted to return back in a human body to teach others how to overcome the laws of the physical universe and to help usher in the coming golden age humanity. His karmic board granted his request and he materialized a new body as the Count du Saint-Germain or the Count of Saint-Germain. He chose his name from the Latin word Sanctus Germanus meaning Holy Brother. The Count was known as the Wonder Man of Europe as he would amaze nobility and royalty alike, many of which commented on his elaborate shoes stubbed with $40,000 diamonds and pearls. Amazingly, he was able to turn rocks into diamonds and remove any flaws. He could write two poems with both hands at the same time. He could read a book by waving his hand over it. He spoke every language, traveled by thought, and worked for peace. He was an accomplished pianist, singer, and violinist. Those who have known him said he played the violin equal to or even surpassing the greatest virtuosos of that period. And Saint Germain even remarked that he had reached the extreme limit possible for his talent. He was also known for his artwork and alchemy. He taught Franz Mesmer his fundamental ideas on personal magnetism and hypnosis, and he initiated Cleostro into the Masonic Order. And with his elixir of life and positive thinking, he never aged at all. According to Germain, it is the activity of our nerves, the flame of our desire, the acid of our fears which daily consume our organism. He who succeeds in raising himself above his emotions and suppressing in himself anger and the fear of illness is capable of overcoming the attrition of the years and attaining an age at least double that at which men now die of old age. He served as a counselor to kings and princes, he fought against deceptive ministers, and he handed the torch of wisdom to Masons and Rosicrucians alike. Prince Karl von Hesse described him as one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived, the friend of humanity whose heart was concerned only with the happiness of others. He worked closely with royalty to help usher in the United States of Europe. But these plans came to an end when Napoleon saw power for his own demise. Despite this failure, he was instrumental in the creation of the United States of America, which he knew would usher in a golden age which would last forever. After St. Germain ascended, he remained in Transylvania, but details of this period of his life remain in the cloak of the Shroud of Mystery. Historians hint that he was possibly adopted into the Royal House of Hungary as the third son of Francis Rokotsi II, using a different name and identity as a convenient disguise. By the year 1700, Transylvania was conquered territory of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Francis Rokotsi II became aware of how Austrian Emperor Leopold had placed his subjects under the bondage of high taxes and oppressive government. He led a successful revolt to liberate his people, but it is unclear what role, if any, Saint Germain played in this plot. Rumors of an elixir of life, which prolonged his lifespan, followed Germain throughout his years. In 1710, Saint Germain appeared in Venice, where he met the musician Jean-Philippe Ramou and the ambassadors to Vienna, the Countess du jean -Lee. He introduced himself under the name of Marquis du Montferrat. At that time, he appeared to be 40 years old and gave the Countess a memorable gift of this magical elixir that maintained her youth for a very long time. Fifty years later, Countess du Jolie met him once again while visiting Madame Pompadour's house, who was the mistress of King Louis XV. She inquired if his father had been in Venice back in 1710. The Count replied, No, Madame, but I myself was living in Venice at the end of the last and the beginning of this century. I had the honor to pay your court then, and you were kind enough to admire a little barcarolle of my composing. The Countess could not believe it, but if that is true, she gasped, you must be at least a hundred years old. The Count smiled, that, Madame, is not impossible. Suspecting the Count was less than truthful, Madame Pompadour inquired again about the Countess and her tale of a so-called elixir life. Germain replied with a smile, It is not impossible, but I confess, it is likely that this lady, for whom I have the greatest respect, is talking nonsense. Undaunted, Madame Pompadour tried many times to get that elixir, but Germain would not share his secrets. However, he was able to make her a cosmetic which enhanced her beauty. 
Hints of his true age continued to surround him with intrigue when in 1723, Saint Germain showed the mother of the Comtesse du Jolie a miniature portrait of his own mother which he kept on his arm. When she saw a beautiful woman dressed in a costume unfamiliar to her own time, the Countess inquired, to what period does this costume belong? The Count merely smiled and changed the subject. If Saint Germain truly had an elixir of life, it would mean he had ultimately mastered the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone, which medieval alchemists believed could transmute the base metals, such as lead, into gold. It seemed likely, if anyone could have figured this out, it would have been Saint Germain, as he closely worked with the Fathers Lucis and with the Knights of the Brothers of Asia, who studied the Rosicrucian and Hermetic Sciences of Alchemy, of which the three parts of the Azoth constituted the Philosopher's Stone. No one really knows if Saint Germain was truly able to turn lead into gold, but in 1727 it appears he had done just that. These secret money-making techniques were shared with certain German bankers and monarchies in the hopes that the wealth generated would benefit all humanity, but instead, they squandered it for themselves. So in 1729, he abandoned support of these power brokers and created the World Trust. From its inception, he stipulated that the World Trust would be released by the year 2000, but this is not an easy task to do, as you will soon see. Saint Germain realized humanity would never be ready for the knowledge and technology of the Aquarian Age until mankind could put aside their destructive sciences and religions and accept the heart of which lies of both, that is, to enter one's heart and harness their own unlimited potential. After the establishment of the World Trust, Saint Germain traveled to the court of the Shah of Persia where he remained from 1737 to 1742. Here he studied the secrets of nature, of which he learned the closely guarded science of precipitating and enlarging gemstones, which was manifested through psychic powers. The Count's love affair with precious stones was well known among his friends and associates. At one point, Saint Germain showed a small box to Madame Pompadour, which contained topazes, emeralds, and diamonds worth at least $9 million in today's money. While in Paris, the aristocracy marveled at his diamond encrusted shoe buckles, but yet no one could identify him or his great source of wealth. Many years later, Madame du Say described within her memoirs how Saint Germain wore an assortment of diamond rings of great value and how his watch and snuff box were ornamented with a profusion of precious stones. She also had witnessed Saint Germain remove a flaw from a large diamond which had belonged to King Louis XV, increasing his value from 6,000 livres to 10,000 livres. The king was never able to get over his astonishment and would often confide that if Saint Germain could increase the value of gemstones, he must be a millionaire. Yet no one could discover his source of wealth, as he never kept any records or held any traceable bank accounts. He would always stay in fine hotels and apartments and would always have as much cash available as needed. When a curious minister spent two years keeping tabs on him, he concluded that Saint Germain paid for everything in real money, but did not have a source of a financial backing. When Saint Germain was confronted about this, he responded, I hold the whole of nature in my hands, and as God created the world, I can draw what I want out of nothing. In 1743, he traveled to London, where for two years he remained in a house on St. Martin Street. During this time, he conducted many alchemical experiments within his laboratory, probably manufacturing artificial diamonds. He was known to frequently visit the Kit Kat Club, where he would mingle with members of the highest nobility. He astounded members with two inventions he was working on, the steam train and steam boat, both of which were predicted by Roger Bacon. Twenty years later, James Walt prototyped his idea by building a steam engine, and later, in 1829, George Stevenson built the first public railway operated by a steam train. After his stay in London, he visited his friend Frederick the Great in his castle of San Sosi in Potsdam, where Voltaire was also an honored guest. In a letter addressed to Frederick, Voltaire later wrote, The Count of Saint Germain is a man who was never born, who will never die, and who knows everything. In 1749, while Versailles, King Louis XV was introduced to the Count by his peer of France to relieve some of his boredom. Soon after, he meets the King's mistress, Madame Pompadour, and becomes a court favorite. The King was captivated by his stories of travel all around the world and his wisdom of the alchemical arts. 
In a gesture of good faith, St. Germain gave away his invention of inexpensive dyes, which helped increase employment and wealth of the nation, while lowering the manufactured cost of clothing, so that commoners could dress as good as the nobility class. In 1755, King Louis XV recruited him to travel to Southeast Asia to infiltrate the British East India Company as a spy. He journeyed in the same ship as General Robert Clive, possibly as a ship's doctor. Here he became aware of the British schemes to subjugate India at the Battle of Pulaski and the recapture of Calcutta. Thanks to his efforts, he saved the lives of many French troops who were protecting the Indian people at that time. When he returned to Europe in 1758, King Louis XV granted him a royal favor for his work in India with a suite of rooms at the Royal Chateau of Chambord in Touraine to continue his experiments of alchemy that King Louis XV sometimes participated in. In a letter written in 1773, Graf Karl Kompenzel of Brussels commented about these alchemical experiments of which the most important were the transmutation of iron into a metal as beautiful as gold. In 1762, he traveled to Russia in a secret plot which put Catherine the Great on the throne. Then in 1774, he returned back to France to deliver a message to the now crowned Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Saint Germain delivered a warning of an approaching conspiracy that would soon occur within the next 15 years, which would create a bloodthirsty republic whose scepter would be the executioner's knife. Sadly, this warning went unheeded, and among the final entries within Marie Antoinette's diary, she recorded her regret at ignoring the Count's advice. Between 1774 and 1784, the Count spent his time traveling throughout Germany and Austria, petitioning the monarchies to work together to avert the French Revolution and to create a United States of Europe. Though the monarchies enjoyed being entertained by Saint Germain's marvelous alchemical experiments, neither they nor their jealous ministers wished to relinquish their power to a unified Europe. With his plans in Europe crumbling apart, he then turned his eyes to the now prosperous New World, because he knew America would play a key role in raising people's consciousness into the Golden Age. On a steamy July 4, 1776, the most influential leaders of the American colonies were locked in Independence Hall, debating whether they should risk a traitor's death by signing the Declaration of Independence. Even though the doors were locked, Saint Germain appeared in the balcony and delivered a fiery speech calling forth the founding fathers to sign that document. He continued, The words of the Declaration will live in the world long after our bones are dust. To the mechanic they will speak hope, to the slave in the mines freedom, but to the coward kings these words will speak tones of warning they cannot choose but hear. Sign that parchment, sign! If the next moment the gibbet's rope is about your neck, sign by all hopes, in life and death, as men, as husbands, as fathers, brothers, or be accursed forever, sign, not only for yourselves, but for all ages, for that parchment will be the textbook of freedom, the Bible of the rights of man forever. I would beg you to sign that parchment for the sake of those millions whose very breath is now hushed in a tense expectation as they look up to you for the awful words, you are free. Unafraid of the repercussions by King George III, these brave men boldly rushed forward and signed their names. So inspired by this speech, John Hancock signed his name in large bold letters so that the king would be able to read it without his spectacles. During the Revolutionary War, Saint Germain was also instrumental in persuading King Louis XVI to appoint the French General Rochambeau over 6,000 troops to serve in George Washington's Continental Army. Historians now agree that this assistance played a critical role in a decisive victory for the American forces. The signing of the Declaration of Independence eventually led way to the liberation of the American colonies into a more perfect union, a place where the virtues of righteousness and freedom could reign under the banner of the United States of America. But trouble was now brewing in Europe. Not only were his plans for the United States of Europe crumbling apart, so too was his Masonic secret society, which had now been infiltrated by the satanic faction of the Bavarian Lodge of Freemasonry, who under the helm of a Jewish Rothschild agent, Adam Weishoff, 
began to rewrite Masonic initiations based on Luciferic teachings of the Talmud, in which enlightenment would be attained through the worship of Lucifer as the ultimate light bearer. They now dubbed themselves the Illuminati and sought to divide the Goyim or the non-Jews through political, social, economic, or religious means. The Rashads planned to use the Illuminati and Freemasonry to destroy the masses so that they could take over the world and to steal all the people's gold so it could be returned to King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. This is why the Rashads financed the creation of Israel and why they are considered its patron saint. This was in direct opposition to St. Germain's version of Freemasonry, in which he envisioned universal enlightenment of one's own inner divine potential would spread to a small group of initiates, and then in turn to other initiates in a vast spiral of spiritual radiation to all humanity. But much to St. Germain's horror, these dark teachings began to spread like a blight within the Masonic Lodges. To counteract the Illuminati movement, he recruited a close group of friends, including Prince Charles of Hesse Castle and Cagliostro, to create a secret society known as the Philolathes, which taught that mankind had infinite possibilities and that they must strive to release themselves of physical matter in order to communicate with higher intelligences. But the Philolathes Society never caught on. At the 1782 Wilsenbad Convention, the Lodges voted to merge Freemasonry with the Illuminati, thus creating the notorious form of modern-day Freemasonry. Three years later, at the Great Paris Convention of 1785, he and along with Cagliostro, Franz Mesmer, and St. Martin tried in vain to bring reconciliation amongst the Rosicrucians, Illuminists, and Masons alike. Had St. Germain been successful in redirecting Freemasonry into a philosopher's organization such as the Philolathes, he would have been able to avert the evil chain of events which have since occurred in preceding generations. After the convention of 1785, St. Germain fell into disgrace. This time, the Jesuits had falsely accused him of immorality, conspiracy to create anarchy, and infidelity. As a result, he played an increasingly diminished role within the very society he had founded nearly 200 years prior. Soon after 1785, the Masonic Lodges began to systematically erase all traces of St. Germain from their order, but with one blazing exception. The letter G, which symbolizes the word Germain, can still be found between the Masonic Square and Compass. Despite Freemasonry's attempts to erase all traces of St. Germain from their order, his vision presses on. Humanity will be set free from its shackles of slavery and death. After the Masonic Schism, St. Germain worked with his close friend, Prince Charles of Hesse Castle in Schleswig, Germany, where they would conduct experiments in alchemy. Growing weary of his failed efforts in Europe, St. Germain sought to remove attention from himself in a more private life. So on February 27, 1784, St. Germain once again faked his own death. After his funeral, the behavior of Prince Charles became uncommunicative and he would often change the subject if anyone spoke of the Count. Those who knew the Prince closely became convinced that not only was the Count still alive, but it appeared the Prince was an accomplice to St. Germain's pretend death. Most historians believe that the Count had now died at this point. However, he resurfaced once again in order to block the attempts of the Illuminati from toppling the French monarchy. In the 18th century, the Rothschild family had managed to become fabulously wealthy by loaning money to the monarchies, but now they desired to open up new markets. They wanted to capture the other 97% of the population who were not royalty, to create a new class of consumers which could then be enslaved with debt. So they recruited Adam Weishoff to provide Maximilian Robespierre their plans for a French Revolution. Early one Sunday morning in 1788, St. Germain visited the Countess de Demar, who was one of Marie Antoinette's ladies-in-waiting. He requested an audience with the Queen to discuss ways to avert the French Revolution. When she arrived, the Count told her, Madame, for twenty years I was on intimate terms with the late King, who deigned to listen to me with kindness. He made use of my poor abilities on several occasions, and I do not think he regretted giving me his confidence. The Count then informed her of a plot by the Encyclopedias and the Duc de Chartreux to overthrow the monarchy. He instructed her to inform the King of this coming conspiracy and requested that the King would not consult with his chief advisor, the Count du Morpa. 
but the king ignored his warning and immediately consulted with the count. And in the midst of the conversation, Saint Germain appeared to confront the Count Dumorpa with his plans to commit treachery, and said to him, In opposing yourself to my seeing the monarch, you are losing the monarchy, for I have but a limited time to give to France. This time over, I shall not be seen here again until after three successive generations have gone down to the grave. The second warning from Saint Germain came on July 14, 1789, after the queen said farewell to the Duchess du Polignac, she opened a letter and read, My words have fallen on your ears in vain, and you have reached the period of which I informed you. All the Polignacs and their friends are doomed to death. The Count d'Artois will perish. On October 5, 1789, Comtesse de Ma received Saint Germain's farewell letter, in which he wrote, All is lost, Countess. The sun is the last which was set on the monarchy. Tomorrow it will exist no more. My vice has been scorned, now it is too late. He then asked the Countess to meet him early the next morning, at which she was informed that the time when he could help France had now passed. He continued, I can do nothing now. My hands are tied by one stronger than myself. The hour of repose is past, and the decrees of Providence must be fulfilled. He then foretold of the death of the Queen, the complete ruin of the House of Bourbon, and the rise of Napoleon. 100 years after his ascension, Saint Germain had brought much enlightenment to the royal courts of Europe, and thanks to his efforts, the creation of the United States of America. Because of this service to humanity, the Great White Brotherhood of Light granted him the office of the Shohan of the Seventh Ray. According to occult philosophy, the seven rays are seven metaphysical principles that govern both individuals and 2,158 year astrological cycles. Our current astrological age of Pisces is dominated by religion and superstitions. Soon, this will be replaced with the age of Aquarius, which will bring about knowledge and wisdom. As director of the Shohan of the Seventh Ray, Saint Germain is responsible for transmuting the old energies of the past in order to bring about the Christ consciousness of the coming golden age of Aquarius. This is why Saint Germain is sometimes referred to as the Cosmic Master of the Age of Aquarius. After he became a Cosmic Master, Saint Germain was not permitted to work with any more individuals with the exception of Napoleon whom he backed and trained. But when Napoleon misused his power for his own demise, Saint Germain withdrew his support. At the end of the 18th century, his efforts to unify Europe now lie in ruins. While the Rothschilds continued to engulf the masses in their costly wars, the satanic cult of the Illuminati was now rotting out all the Masonic lodges. There was little else he could do but wait for a better time in which humanity would be more receptive to the ideas of a golden age. So he took a break from European politics and settled in Tibet. In 1790, Saint Germain confided his future plans with his Austrian friend, Franz Graffer, saying, Tomorrow night I am off. I am much needed in Constantinople than in England, there to prepare two new inventions which you will have in the next century, trains and steamboats. Towards the end of this century, I shall disappear out of Europe and betake myself to the region of the Himalayas. I will rest. I must rest. Exactly in 85 years will people again set eyes on me. Farewell. While in Tibet, Saint Germain studied under the Trans-Himalayan Brotherhood as a Shabalan master, who were exalted teachers known to possess wonderful powers. Little else is known of this period, but it is likely he could have traveled into the inner earth tunnels of Shambhala to study with other ascended masters. True to his promise, 85 years later, Saint Germain returned to Europe with a new goal in mind. In 1875, Saint Germain convinced the royal families and nations under colonial rule to merge their assets into one account known as the Combined International Collateral Accounts of the Global Debt Facility. They agreed to do this because they wanted to wait for the right time to release these funds so that it could benefit all the world's people. Only kings or queens, presidents, prime ministers, and in some cases ministers of finance are granted access to these accounts. The collateral accounts contain a minimum of 20 million metric tons of gold, thousands of tons of platinum and silver, and thousands of boxes of precious gems, sovereign certificates, which are collateralized by other mineral wealth, including oil, copper, uranium, and nickel, 
Plus, there are works of art, sovereign monarch treasures, and ancient treasures, including Aztec, Egyptian, and King Solomon's gold. St. Germain placed the collateral accounts within the newly created Foundation Divine, which also contains the World Trust created back in 1729. After 250 years of compound interest, the World Trust has now mushroomed into a net worth in excess of one quattrodecian dollars, or a one with 45 zeros. Enough money to buy a gold cube the size of the orbit of Saturn. So astronomical, most people would not even believe it. These figures may appear to be far-fetched considering the world GDP is $55 trillion annually. However, governments maintain two sets of accounting books, one which is displayed to the public, which contains official data issued by the government, and another secretive version, which is used between sovereign entities. It is this secretive ledger which contains both the collateral accounts and St. Germain's World Trust. Some of this wealth is stored in different dimensions, but much of it is stored under international treaty custodianship rules within the world's major banking houses. In the case of the collateral accounts, they are held within the Institutional Parent Administration account of the Federal Reserve under the control of the Bank of International Settlements, and in turn, Foundation Divine. This wealth is intended to be used to buy out all Illuminati-controlled governments, oil corporations, media conglomerates, banking houses, pharmaceutical cartels, and it would zero out all debt. It is estimated it would cost a minimum of a hundred quintillion dollars just to correct the world's current economic problems. In order for these funds to reach the common man, it must travel down through a series of 30,000 different trust funds beginning with World Trust. The top level contains the World Trust and remains under the trusteeship of Master Saint Germain. Under his orders, the World Court will activate the funding process. Level 2 contains 180 Royal Trusts, which are under the control of the trustees in various sovereign countries. Examples include the French Trust, the Russian Trust, and the Vatican Trust. Level 3 are the various Illuminati Family Trusts, which are under the control of the trustees of the world's wealthiest families, including the Warburg Trust, the Rothschild Trust, and the Rockefeller Trust. Level 4 contains the 250 plus corporate trusts, under the control of the trustees from the world's most powerful companies and corporations, including General Electric, Lockheed, and AT&T. Level 5 contains the wealth from enlightened robber baron children, which was placed aside to be used for the benefit of all humanity. These are known as the Prosperity Program Trusts and Bank Roll Programs, and they are managed by the IMF under the guidance of St. Germain. Altogether, there are 72 various bank roll programs, including Bergerveen, Omega, and Freedom. The largest trust fund is Freedom, and this must be funded first. When this happens, St. Germain's wealth will finally reach the hands of all humanity. But if a problem occurs in this chain, the funding window will close. As the funds travel through each level, they must be signed off by four to five trustees per trust. If the trustees decide to block the money, then the funding process comes to an end. With each trust level, the trustees must only use certain designated safe banks and sign the proper documents with only certain designated banking personnel at those banks. Should this process be activated and then stalled by deceitful bankers or trustees, or if the deadline for funding certain trusts is not met in a timely manner, then the funding window will close. But this is the problem. Members of the Bush and Clinton families have been blocking the release of these funds because they are overseeing many of the trusts as trustees. After World War II from 1945 to 1995, the assets and the collateral accounts were managed by the Trilenium Trilateral Tripartite Commission, representing the United States of America, the United Kingdom, and France. This commission selected the dollar as an international reserve currency and gave the CIA legal responsibility to protect the collateral assets. Nations which did not want a permanent CIA presence on their soil will be allowed to subcontract the protection under the same terms and conditions of the treaties. Extensions of this agreement were expanded through international treaties, some of which are still classified as top secret. With the CIA now in charge of protecting these assets, it didn't take long before problems arrived. Sadly, certain rogue elements within the CIA and the Bush family have managed to steal over $200 trillion from the collateral accounts, stored in places like the Philippines, Thailand, and Russia. 
In 1981, Ronald Reagan commissioned Leo Wanta to steal $27.5 trillion from the collateral accounts in Russia, which was then used to crash the ruble, collapsing the Soviet Union. This money belongs to the Russian people and must be returned back to them. In the 1980s, while V.K. Durham was flipping through an old Bible, she found an 1875 Peruvian gold certificate with a face value of $1,000 plus accrued interest. Today, this bond is worth over $6.5 trillion, collateralized by gold from within the collateral accounts. When George Bush Sr. learned of this gold certificate, he tried unsuccessfully to get his hands on it. Eventually, V.K. Durham lost control over the money, and it now sits within St. Germain's World Trust. Instead of hiding this wealth somewhere in the United States, like Fort Knox, they chose to stash this loot for their own personal benefit in all places, a CIA-controlled depository in Montevideo, Uruguay. Remember, after World War II, Uruguay was considered a safe haven for escaping Nazis. The Bush family, known for their Nazi ties, have purchased large ranches in both Uruguay and Paraguay. They may think they can get away with crashing the world economy and hiding out with their stolen loot, but this will never happen. The world must hold these people accountable for their crimes. This stolen money is now being used for every New World Order pet project imaginable, ranging from NASA, militarized space weapons, electronic mind control, and financial warfare. If you ever wondered where they got the money to build those Black Project anti-gravity vehicles, look no further as all treaties are classified top secret. In 1963, President Kennedy tried to stop this illegal activity and bring this wealth to the people of the world through the Green Hilton Agreement. This would allow the United States, as holders of the international reserve currency, to print a new gold-backed currency using assets from the collateral accounts to boost economic development throughout the world. On June 4, 1963, President Kennedy signed Executive Order 11110, which would strip the Federal Reserve Bank of its ability to loan money to the United States with interest, and it required a bullion-backed currency issued by the U.S. Treasury instead of the Federal Reserve Bank. Soon after, $2 and $5 notes backed by silver were issued, which read United States note instead of Federal Reserve note. Certain elements within the world's elite could not let this happen, and thus, Kennedy had to go. The Green-Hilton Agreement and Executive Order 11110 were both signed into law, but shortly after Kennedy's death was unrecognized by the United States and later other nations of the world. To curtail these illegal activities, in 1995, the Trilinium Trilateral Tripartite Commission was stripped of its power and placed under the control of the United Nations. The collateral accounts now remain under the supervision of St. Germain and Dr. Tsai Sheng Li of Nationalist China under the Office of International Treasury Control at the UN. Despite these actions, the U.S. corporate government, the World Bank, the Bank of International Settlements, and the IMF continue their illegal activities without giving a care for the needs of the people of the world. In international finance, there is a term known as arbitrage, which allows one to profit in a short period of time from rolling money over and over again. This has allowed the robber barons and Illuminati elitists to generate enormous amounts of wealth by raping the world of its assets through either insider trading or by manufacturing money using fractional reserve banking. When a banker is licensed to create money through fractional reserve banking, they have been given the right to create money out of thin air. This occurs when a bank loans out a proportion of their assets at a rate of, say, 1 to 10. In other words, a bank must have $1 deposits on their balance sheet for every $9 of loans. The other 9 tenths is simply manufactured out of thin air. After the debt is paid in full, the banks simply delete this money from their ledgers, causing it to vanish from thin air. These loans are then spent throughout the economy and eventually fall into the hands of the average American to be spent in their day-to-day -day lives. However, while these loans are increasing the size of the money supply, the interest portion of these loans are decreasing it at a faster rate. This is because banks do not issue enough money into the money supply to cover the interest payments of these loans. Therefore, more and more debt has to be issued to continue financing the ever-growing interest debt bubble. Eventually, everyone but the parasitic bankers will run out of money, allowing them to foreclose on the entire world. While the masses were enslaved under fractional reserve banking, the elites were profiting handsomely. 
By using the power of leverage, a bank could bring in a 63% annual profit margin, assuming a conservative lending ratio of 1 to 10 and an interest rate of 7%. In this example, a bank has $10 million of deposits and $90 million of loans. At an interest rate of 7%, this $90 million loan portfolio would rake in $6.3 million of profit annually. A $6.3 million profit margin doesn't sound so bad considering the original investment was only $10 million. However, this crude example does not account for the carry trade or fancy derivatives, which could easily enhance the banker's profits in excess of 300% annually. Wealthy investors are able to tap in these profits by investing in bank trades, which are conducted on a monthly basis. At the end of each month, money is then rolled again, thus giving the name of the bank roll programs. The prosperity funds, which originate from confiscated accounts taken from the Federal Reserve, were also placed into these bank roll programs, but more about this later. Today, there are at least 72 bank roll programs, including Bergerine, Savage, SBC Charcoal, ITI, Morgan, Hong Kong, Omega, and Freedom. They are maintained and audited by Price Waterhouse, the IMF, and the Treasury of the Republic of the United States, and are deposited in IMF-controlled offshore banks. The reason you may never heard of these secretive trading programs is because investors are required to have a minimum of $100 million or more just to make a trade. Any inquiries about these programs are deflected and attention is instead focused on the warnings issued by government agencies about fake programs. When combined with numerous prosecutions of fraudulent high yield investment transactions that occur each year, the public is led to believe that these programs do not exist. Around the turn of the century, some of the wealthy robber baron children placed aside a small amount of their family's money into these programs to be used for the benefit of all the people in the world. These wealthy investors are known as wealthy visionaries or white knights. In the early 1990s, they invited a few wealthy multiple level marketers to open up an accumulator account at the IMF, allowing them to make a bank trade within the bank roll programs with less money. But this was a big mistake, and soon word of these programs began to spread, allowing any investor to invest in these bank roll programs with as little as $100. These small amounts were handled by trustees who collected the money and kept records and combined the small investments into a larger amount, such as $1 million, that was required to enter a roll. These accumulator accounts were eventually closed to new investors in the 1990s. However, the original investors are still waiting to be paid because payment can only be made with a gold-backed currency. Otherwise, the Federal Reserve bankers would just steal the money under the current fiat credit system. The bankers angry that the bank roll programs were found out by the people fought long and hard to stop the programs from funding. Even though thousands of people had invested money and a great deal of wealth was generated, little, if anything, was ever paid back to the investors. Corruption, greed, and murder became widespread among the bankers, government, and even some trustees who stole the money for themselves. Program managers were lied to, bribed, and many were hauled into court under false pretense, such as trustees Clyde Hood and Mike Kodowski. Some investors were offered their money back, but most refused to accept payment because they did not trust the government. Since the fall of Atlantis, Satan and his minions have been working tirelessly to end all goodness on this planet. But God and the Brotherhood of Light have put together their own plan to defeat the dark side. Throughout history, many prophets have come forth to speak of the coming golden age of humanity. This truth was made known only to fall silent on the deaf ears of the ignorant masses. But change is on the horizon. A dark day is about to unfold. To understand how the world got into this mess, we must now travel back in time to the very founding of the American Republic. 
Prior to the Revolutionary War, the American colonies had grown quite prosperous, with full employment in a very short period of time. When King George III asked Benjamin Franklin the secret of the success, Franklin responded, It is because in the colonies we issue our own paper money, we call it colonial script, and we issue only enough to move all goods freely from the producers to the consumers, and as we create our money, we control the purchasing power of money, and have no interest to pay. But the king was jealous of the success of the colonies and their paper-based fiat money system, which was not backed by precious metals. Life in Georgian England was an entirely different story. High taxation meant the prisons were filled with debtors, and the streets were filled with unemployed beggars with little hope of escape. The taxes paid to the king barely covered the interest payment on the debts he owed to Mayor Amschel Rothschild. With the wealthy in England overtaxed, King George turned to the colonists by requiring all taxes to be paid in gold coins rather than colonial script. Since the colonists had very little gold, unemployment and cries for war soon surfaced. Benjamin Franklin later said that this was the true cause of the war, not the tax on tea or the Stamp Act as taught in the history books over and over again. Violent opposition soon broke out, forcing King George to send English soldiers to enforce the new taxes. When these troops refused to fire on British citizens, the king agreed to let Mayor Rothschild purchase German Hessian troops as mercenary fighters dressed in British uniforms to collect his debt for him. When it became clear these Hessian troops could not successfully defeat the Continental Army, King George finally relinquished and said, We may have lost the colony, but we will get her back. To bring the colonists to their knees, Mayor Rothschild proposed a novel idea. He would loan money to the Continental Army through British Rothschild agents in France in order to control them. From that point on, England stopped trying to divide and conquer America through force, but instead chose to retake her colonies through the stealth of divide and control. To implement this new policy, he recruited a network of British spies still loyal to the crown to infiltrate and guide the new republic's government into the hands of British bankers. In 1788, before the United States even existed, British war loans were now coming due. Because the federal government had no significant financial resources to pay these loans, they declared bankruptcy and placed the debt on the states instead of the people. To make the war debt pending against the people, in 1790 Congress passed an act making a provision for the payment of the debt of the United States. This act abolished states of the republic and created federal districts in their place. A portion of the war debts was then placed in each one of these districts. Soon after, all the states and citizens were reorganized as corporations, and as a corporation you are not subject to the Bill of Rights. This may explain why you feel like you have no rights under the Constitution. It's because you don't. You are not subject to it. Even though the colonists had removed British troops from their lands, they were now at the mercy of British bankers. After defaulting on their war debts, one of President Washington's first acts in power was to declare a financial emergency. Desperate for funds, the United States allowed the creation of a private central bank controlled by the Bank of England and the Rothschild family by pledging the assets and securities of the United States as collateral. Despite the protest of the Democrats and Republicans led by Thomas Jefferson, Washington recruited the aid of Alexander Hamilton, who was Secretary of Treasury and a Rothschild agent, to draft a proposal which in 1791 became the Bank of the United States. Just like the Bank of England, which was also privately owned, the Bank of the United States was named in such a way to conceal its true ownership. This bank was given a 20-year charter and capitalized with $10 million, 80% of which was owned by foreign bankers. Using fractional reserve banking, the bank was authorized to loan out twice as much money as it had in reserves, or $20 million. This made a profitable enterprise for the bankers, as they could collect interest on an extra $10 million that was simply manufactured out of thin air. By 1796, the national debt of the United States government had grown to $6.2 million, forcing the government to sell most of its own shares in the Bank of the United States. By 1802, the government owned no stock in its own bank. 
With the outbreak of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe in 1803, the relationship between the United States and Great Britain had begun to deteriorate. Britain had imposed a blockade on all neutral countries, including the United States. During this time, Britain was taking American sailors as hostages from their ships to serve in the British Navy. In response to this increasing infiltration of troublemakers and a host of British spies within the United States, Congress passed an amendment which prevented anyone who held titles of nobility or connections to the Crown of England from holding public office, such as Esquire Attorney, Doctor, and Clergyman. These titles were authorized under the Crown of England for English citizens, and thus, these holders are foreign agents of the Crown. The Titles of Nobility Amendment, also known as the 13th Amendment, was approved by Congress and the House of Representatives in 1810. It was ratified by all the necessary states into law on March 12, 1819. It reads as follows. If any citizen of the United States shall accept, claim, receive, or retain any title, nobility, or honor, or shall, without the consent of Congress, accept and retain any present, pension, office, or emolument of any kind whatever from any emperor, king, prince, or foreign power, such person shall cease to be a citizen of the United States, and shall be incapable of holding any office of trust or profit under them, or either of them. Titles and Nobility Amendment, 1810. After the passage of the Titles and Nobility Amendment, Congress went one step further by severing British control over the financial system when they refused to renew the first United States Bank Charter, which expired on February 20th, 1811. Nathan Mayer Rothschild was quoted as saying, Either the application for the renewal of the Charter is granted, or the United States will find itself involved in a most disastrous war. When it became apparent the United States would not go along with the banker's schemes, Rothschild responded, Teach those impudent Americans a lesson. Bring them back to colonial status. In retaliation for refusing to do business on their terms, European investors withdrew $7 million in specie or coin money from the U.S. economy, resulting in an economic recession and the eventual outbreak of the War of 1812. The causes of the War of 1812 were triggered by England's loss of control over the United States monetary system, and even more worrisome, the Titles of Nobility Amendment prevented British agents from meddling in the affairs of the New Republic's government so England ordered their soldiers to burn down Washington, D.C. With the White House and the Library of Congress now in flames, evidence of the original title nobility amendment was destroyed. The British crown knew the American people would no longer tolerate British rule again, so they returned the Republic back to the American people with one exception. The 13th Amendment was to be removed from the Constitution. This amendment began disappearing from text in 1832 and by 1876 was removed from all official state publications thanks to extreme bribery from the Rothschild Banking Syndicate. Proof that the 13th Amendment was ratified was found in 1983 by archive researcher David Dodge and Tom Dunn in a rural Maine library. After the War of 1812, English bankers, such as the Rothschilds, sought to recapture the American economy. They knew if they could control the money supply, they would not care who created the laws. Thanks to all the new war debt which needed financing, they got their wish when President James Madison granted a charter to the Second National Bank in 1816. But this bank was laced with political corruption, as they would often purchase politicians by funding their election campaigns. The newly elected President Andrew Jackson responded to their mischief with these famous words. You are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rot you out, and by the eternal God, I will rot you out. After a failed assassination attempt, he told his close friend and the future President Martin Van Buren, The bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. In 1832, Andrew Jackson vetoed a renewal of the bank's charter on the grounds the bank was unconstitutional. He successfully paid off the national debt for the first time in the nation's history with a surplus of $5,000. After the bank charter had expired, the books were opened up and Congress was shocked to learn that every single stockholder was a British citizen. On January 30, 1835, President Andrew Jackson attended a congressional funeral in the Capitol building. 
As he exited, Richard Lawrence fired a pistol at Jackson, but the percussion cap exploded and the bullet would not discharge. So an enraged Jackson strikes his cane at the attacker, who then fires another bullet, which also failed to discharge. Jackson later claims the Rothschilds were responsible for this incident. In 1857, the Illuminati met in London to decide America's fate. They knew if they could incite an expensive and costly war, then the United States would be forced to charter a central bank. But because Canada and Mexico were too weak to fight a war, and England, France, and Russia were too far away, they decided to ferment a civil war between the North and the South. The North was become a British colony annexed to Canada under the control of Lionel Rothschild, and the South with its valuable cotton industry was to be given to Napoleon III of France to be controlled by James Rothschild. By the 1860s, slavery was gradually becoming obsolete thanks to increased education and changing of attitudes. But the Illuminati capitalized on the racial tensions in order to divide and control America through civil war. Albert Pike, the head of both the Masonic and Illuminati order, recruited the help of the Knights of the Golden Circle, which was formed in 1854 by George Bickley. Their members included a who's who of notable people, including President of the Confederate States, Jefferson Davis, John Wilkes Booth, and the infamous bank robber, Jesse James, whose operations helped fund the Civil War. Later, in 1867, the Knights of the Golden Circle spun off the Ku Klux Klan. In 1861, Lincoln approached Rothschild-controlled banks in New York to raise money for the Civil War. After they quoted him an insane user's interest rate of 24 to 36 percent, Lincoln ordered the U.S. Treasury to print the money debt-free. In 1972, the U.S. Treasury Department computed that this move saved the government nearly $4 billion of interest. These debt-free notes, backed by precious metals, were known as greenbacks due to the green-colored ink printed on the back. During the course of the war, and later during the Reconstruction era that soon followed, over $449 million were issued, bringing both value and stability to the war-torn republic and to help restore constitutional control over the money supply. In response to the greenbacks, Lincoln once said, We gave the people of this republic the greatest blessing they ever had, their own paper money to pay their own debts. The Civil War created many challenges for Lincoln, but some of his mistakes are still haunting us to this day. In particular, the early foundation of a shadow government and the true meaning of a 14th Amendment citizen. The concept of a shadow government within the United States first began on March 27, 1861, when the southern states walked out of Congress. Because there were not enough members present in Congress to conduct a legislative session under the rules of parliamentary law, the only lawful authority they had was to vote on a time to reconvene for a new session. But instead of agreeing on a new time to reassemble, they chose to abandon Congress altogether. This created a constitutional crisis which placed Congress in sine die, which literally means without day. In sine die, Congress was no longer a lawful body, and therefore, they could no longer declare war under a constitutional authority. In addition, the Constitution of the United States had ceased to exist when parties from the southern states had ceded from the Union and because northern states had declared their own state legislatures in Sinai. In response to the Constitutional Crisis, on April 15, 1861, Lincoln signed an executive order known as Executive Proclamation 1, which declared a national emergency and placed the federal territories under martial law to be ruled by executive powers. Because the federal government within the District of Columbia did not have any jurisdiction in the state territories, on April 24, 1863, he commissioned General Orders No. 100, also known as the Libra Code, to extend the laws of the District of Columbia beyond the boundaries of Washington, D.C. into the several states placing all Americans under military occupation of the United States government. After the conclusion of the Civil War, Lincoln intended to end the Libra Code and return to constitutional law, but his plans were cut short when he was assassinated. As a result, martial law under a shadow government continues to this day. Not only did the Libra Code enable Lincoln to sidestep the constitutional crisis, but it also allowed him to navigate around Rothschild-controlled interests. 
In 1865, the war was now going badly for Lincoln, when he delivered a message to Congress saying, I have two great enemies, the Southern Army in front of me, and the financial institutions in the rear. Of the two, the one in my rear is my greatest foe. In 1862, the Rothschild's plans for the invasion of the United States was on schedule when England had stationed 8,000 troops in Canada and France had stationed 30,000 troops in Mexico. To deal with the Rothschild problem, Lincoln had contacted his friend, Tsar Alexander II of Russia, for military assistance because he too was opposed to a Rothschild-controlled central bank in his country and because Lincoln showed goodwill by emancipating the slaves. To ensure military victory for the Union forces, Tsar Alexander parked his naval fleet in the New York and San Francisco harbor to block any invasion attempts by the English or French. Because of their help, and because the Tsars blocked the creation of a Zionist one-world government at the Congress of Vienna in 1815, the Rothschilds had sealed their fate. When 60 years later, the Tsar dynasty had met their own downfall at the hands of Rothschild agents during the Bolshevik Revolution. By opposing the Rothschilds and by printing the greenbacks, English bankers had signed President Lincoln's death warrant, so they hired John Wilkes Booth to assassinate Lincoln. Sadly, a local vagrant was found nearby in a hay barn and was innocently charged and sentenced for the crime. After escaping from his captors, John Wilkes Booth lived out the remainder of his life in comfortable surroundings in England. In 1868, the 14th Amendment was ratified, ending slavery by giving all Americans citizenship. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they reside. United States Code Annotated Amendment 14. However, what the public was not told, that while under the Lieber Code, a 14th Amendment citizen can only be found within the jurisdiction of the United States. That is, all government employees, all those who live in territories occupied by the federal government, such as Washington, D.C., and the former slaves. The rest of the population was not subject to the 14th Amendment and thus could still claim jurisdiction under the original Constitution. In addition to that, after the conclusion of the Civil War, the federal government was now occupying the southern states, placing these captured citizens under the jurisdiction of the Libra Code. The southern states had to agree to ratify this amendment in order for them to be granted their freedom from federal rule. Thus, instead of ending slavery, the 14th Amendment held all southerners captive as slaves in the plantation known as the United States of America. Just like how all citizens were turned into corporations in 1790 to subject them to the Revolutionary War debts, 14th Amendment citizens were created to be franchisees subject to the corporation known as the United States Incorporated. And like all corporate brands, you do not have any constitutional Bill of Rights protections. Proof of such can be found in the all caps version of your name, which signifies a corporate entity. After the Civil War, the United States defaulted on its war debt. During the bankruptcy proceedings, cunning lawyers in league with international bankers found a loophole within Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the United States Constitution, which allowed the creation of a duplicate entity known as the Corporation of the United States of America to replace the now bankrupt and defunct Republic of the United States of America. This occurred with the passage of the District of Columbia Organic Act of 1871, which incorporated the area of the District of Columbia into a private foreign corporation chartered in the city of London known as the United States Incorporated. This corporation designated Congress as the Board of Directors to continue the business needs of the government under martial law. Thanks to the Lieber Code, federal jurisdiction under the Organic Act was expanded to include not only all captured citizens in the southern states, but all Americans in all states. Thus, America had lost her sovereignty under the yoke of the Crown of England and the international bankers. During this same time, the Corporation of the United States adopted its own constitution, which was identical to the original national constitution. To fool the people, one word was changed from its original form, the Constitution for the United States of America, to its present day all capitalized form, which signifies a corporate entity, the Constitution of the United States of America. Incidentally, the Titles of Nobility Amendment was removed from this new Constitution. 
With the Illuminati in full control over the United States, they now sought to rule the world. After the death of Adam Weishoff in 1830, Giuseppe Mazzini was selected to head the Illuminati. In 1871, the mantle of power was passed on again to the American General Albert Pike as its new director. Pike became fascinated with the idea of a one-world government and eventually constructed the Illuminati's blueprint of world domination. His plans called for the financing of three world wars in the 20th century. The first war would bring about an atheist communist state from the ashes of Tsarist Russia. The second war would bring about a Jewish holocaust under a fascist government to ferment support of a Zionist state of Israel. The third war would manipulate the differences of Christians and Muslims for their own annihilation. Then finally, political Zionism would come out as victors of all. These three world wars would require enormous funding. Since most of the royalty in Europe was already deeply in debt thanks to the numerous wars and conflicts created by the Rothschild banking dynasty, the only place left that could possibly pay for such ambitious plans was the now prosperous American Republic. After the Civil War, the United States went through a great industrial expansion. The new industries of oil, steel, textile, and railroad all needed generous financing, which the Rothschild family was more than eager to provide. To access these markets, the Rothschilds sent their agent, Jacob Schiff, to infiltrate the New York banking scene, which was controlled by J.P. Morgan. By the turn of the century, the Rothschilds had fully entrenched themselves into the tight fraternity of Wall Street banks, such as Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers. They now sought their most prized possession, full control over the American monetary system. With help from Jacob Schiff and J.P. Morgan, the Rothschilds formed a scheme which would seduce Congress into relinquishing control over the money supply. This occurred with the Panic of 1907, when a liquidity crisis caused many banks and businesses to fail all across the United States. The meltdown began when J.P. Morgan published rumors that the Knickerbocker Trust Company of New York was insolvent. With a bank run on hand, they were forced to call in their loans, creating a chain reaction which would threaten to implode the entire banking system. The failures continued until J.P. Morgan & Company provided a generous loan to the insolvent banks. But J.P. Morgan was not trying to save the American banking system, but rather, he used the crisis to destroy his competition by choosing which banks he would bail out. But the biggest casualty of the economic fallout was the looming bankruptcy of the Corporation of the United States, which had no means to pay back their loans which were due in 1912. In anticipation of this bankruptcy, representatives from the world's most powerful families met in November 1910 at a secret meeting at the Jekyll Island Club Resort in Georgia to discuss the foreclosure of the Corporation of the United States and to brainstorm solutions which would prevent future liquidity crisis such as occurred during the Panic of 1907. Those in attendance included Senator Nelson Aldrich, Paul Warburg, representatives from J.P. Morgan and & Company, and Jacob Schiff, representing the Rothschild family. They proposed a 20-year extension on the national debt if the United States would agree to charter a privately owned central bank, which would serve as a bank of last resort by lending money to other insolvent banks in order to prevent future bank runs. A week later, they emerged with their plans to create what is known as the Federal Reserve System. Because the current President Taft would never agree to sign away the American monetary system to a cabal of international bankers, they waited until they got their man, the progressive Woodrow Wilson, into power. In return for the bankers' generous campaign contributions, Woodrow Wilson reluctantly promised the bankers he would sign the Federal Reserve Act if he was elected into office. Many powerful forces were opposed to the creation of a privately controlled central bank. To neutralize this threat, J.P. Morgan invited the major opponents of the Federal Reserve Act on board the maiden voyage of the newly built Titanic luxury steamliner built by the White Star Line owned by J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan ordered the captain to steer his ship into an iceberg and under gunpoint prevented the men from escaping onto the lifeboats, killing many of his enemies in one large swoop. When word of this got back to Woodrow Wilson, he commented, 
There exists this power in the world, so subtle, so organized, so watchful, that we dare not speak above a whisper when we speak in condimentation of it. At the beginning of 1913, the United States had defaulted on its debt. After being denied a new line of credit, the now President Woodrow Wilson faced a constitutional crisis. With no other sources of funding, he went along with the banker's schemes engineered at the Jekyll Island Resort. To avoid any opposition, Senator Nelson Oddridge quickly pushed the Federal Reserve Act through both houses of Congress. On December 23, 1913, while most of Congress was away on Christmas vacation, a quorum call was issued. A few selected congressional traders voted by voice to avoid public record and pass the Federal Reserve Act, which President Wilson signed into law. Wilson later admitted with remorse when referring to the Fed, I have unwittingly ruined my country. This act gave away the keys of the printing presses at the U.S. Treasury to a foreign corporation chartered under the Crown of England known as the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve was created by Congress in 1913 and it was entrusted with the power granted originally to the Congress by the U.S. Constitution to coin money and regulate the value thereof. The Federal Reserve Bank advertises itself as a non-profit corporation that operates as if it's another branch of the government. However, its board members are unelected and their meetings are conducted behind the closed doors away from public scrutiny. The board of directors of the Federal Reserve System is chosen by the president from a list prepared by the bankers themselves. It's important that whomever I pick uh, is viewed as an independent person from politics. All this secrecy becomes very suspicious, considering how the Federal Reserve monitors and controls trillions of dollars within the world's banking system. After the federal government lost its ability to issue its own money, the national debt soon soared to astronomical heights, because now the government had to pay the Federal Reserve interest on all its currency printed to circulation. But this interest on the national debt could never be repaid, as the Federal Reserve required all debts to be repaid with gold, which the government did not have. And even worse, the interest portion of the national debt was not issued into the money supply. In other words, more and more debt would have to be issued to continue servicing the growing interest payments on all loans. In order to cover this interest payment, Congress was forced to pass the income tax legislation, which became law in 1913 with the ratification of the 16th Amendment, also known as the Income Tax Amendment. Initially, they levied a 1% voluntary tax on all incomes over 3,000 and a progressive surtax on all incomes over 20,000, but this would soon increase with the outbreak of World War I and World War II. Income tax allowed the Federal Reserve System to confiscate the earnings of the common man. But the industrialists and financiers were exempted from paying any income tax because they could afford to hide their assets in tax-free foundations which they claim were devoted to philanthropy. Examples of such include the Rockefeller Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the Carnegie Endowment. The main purpose of the income tax is not to raise revenue, but to redistribute wealth and to control society. Technically, the 16th Amendment was not ratified by the necessary states as it violates the constitutional clause of no direct taxes. Despite this, Congress went ahead and taxed the people anyway. The government was able to do this because under their corporate charter, Congress was operating as the board of directors and therefore they had the authority to enter this amendment as ratified. But remember, this amendment has nothing to do with the original United States Constitution, which was replaced back in 1871 with the corporate constitution. It's actually very simple. Congress tried to enact an income tax in 1894. The Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. When the Supreme Court says something is unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional. They tried again in 1913, and the Supreme Court said the 16th Amendment conferred no new power of taxation. So if they didn't have it then, and they didn't get it, they don't have it. There is no constitutional basis for a tax on the wages of Americans living and working in the 50 states of the Union. Period. End of argument. In 1933, the United States once again declared bankruptcy. 
To make all citizens subject to the repayment of a national debt, the bankers chartered a Delaware corporation known as the Bureau of Internal Revenue. But this corporation was illegally masquerading as part of the government, placing them under constant threat of lawsuit. To escape this litigation, they moved their jurisdiction outside of the United States to Puerto Rico. This occurred in 1953 when they changed their name to the Internal Revenue Service, or IRS, incorporated as a Puerto Rican trust within the division of the Department of the Treasury of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Further proof can be found within the United States Code, which lists the IRS as Trust Fund No. 62, the Puerto Rico Special Fund Internal Revenue. This was done to divert all income tax payments to the International Monetary Fund owned by the various central banks of Europe and North America, which in turn are owned by the Crown of England. There is a substantial, conclusive body of evidence that proves that our income tax system represents the most pernicious form of tyranny. It is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated by government against the working men and women of America. I could eliminate all income taxes tomorrow and have more than enough money to fund the government by using some other guy's bright idea. We tax the Federal Reserve at point triple zero six, doubles our money until we decide to put them out of business permanently, because we certainly should not have central banks. The evidence proving income tax is paid to the United Kingdom is found deep within the IRS individual master file, which contains every transaction and financial record gathered by IRS officials throughout your lifetime. One of these codes determines what kind of tax you are paying. After looking this code up within the IRS 6209 manual, you find that they have incorrectly classified all Americans as domiciled corporations in either Guam, the Virgin Islands, or Puerto Rico. Furthermore, all taxpayers who filled out a 1040 form are subject to a tax for doing commerce with the United Kingdom under a treaty with the United States. There is no law. There is no law that requires the average American worker in the private sector to pay a direct unapportioned tax on their labor and compensation for services. There is no law. As you follow the money trail, you find that the taxes collected on the 1040 form is then sent to the Crown of England as a tribute payment. The Crown of England is a sovereign corporation located within the 677 acres of the city, found within the heart of Greater London. This tiny strip of land contains the world's most powerful banking houses, such as the Bank of England and Lloyd's of London, owned by the House of Rothschild. It is these bankers and their counterpart, the Temple Bar Attorneys, that constitute the power base known simply as the Crown. Even though the Queen of England is a member of this club, she is not its corporate head. That job was given to the Pontiff of Rome. The Pope was given control over the monarchy with the signing of the Treaty of 1213 between King John and Pope Innocent III, which forever pledged England as a vassal state of the Holy Roman Empire. In 1297, that treaty was used as a precedent to incorporate the city as an independent city-state controlled by the Vatican, which would govern England without directly relying on the monarchy. Just like how the Corporation of the United States was subject to the Crown of England, so too were the subjects of the British Empire, enslaved with debt by the financial division of the Vatican, headquartered within the city of London. Today, this small clique of bankers have full authority over the affairs of Parliament, and this has been the case since 1694 when Pope Innocent XI hired William of Orange to dispose the Stuart Kings and charter the Bank of England. Located within the Crown of England is the original Federal Reserve Charter, which according to the Farmer Claims Legal Team, allocates that 67% of the income tax collected by the IRS was be divided to the Crown of England. Another 23% was be paid as a dividend to the 300 shareholders of the Federal Reserve Bank, and the last 10% was be paid to the employees of the IRS to keep them quiet about this sweet deal. Since 1913, none of the income tax collected by the IRS has gone to the federal government. The federal government is funded totally through black budget sources such as drug trafficking and off-budget accounting on the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, also known as the CAFR, was based on techniques first used by the Mafia to hide their assets. 
In 1946, the government adopted the same methods when a private organization known as the Government Finance Officers Association created a policy which changed the government from a pay-as-you-go structure into a for-profit structure used by corporate America. Soon after, governments began using a financial statement which allowed them to create multiple profit centers and investment accounts and to do it in such a way that the public would never figure out. Over time, the government began to make so much money that they overtook the Mafia as the biggest game in town. In 1977, GOFA spun off another private organization known as the Government Accounting Standards Board, which promoted the lucrative benefits of a standardized financial statement. Soon all local, county, and state governments jumped on board and began producing their own version of either a comprehensive annual financial report, or an annual financial report, or on the federal level, a consolidated financial statement. As of 2005, there are over 148,000 individual government financial statements in the United States, with a combined local, state, and federal level investment of at least $110 trillion. With so much money, one must ask why the government has any debt at all. To answer this is complex, because the government's debts are financed indirectly through their own investment funds. This was done to subject the people to the repayment of the debt, while at the same time the government could steal all the wealth of the people. The CAFR allows the government to hide their assets through the use of two sets of accounting books. One is the budget report, which is presented to the public as the actual budget. The only income that must be reported in government budget reports are taxes, fines, and fees. But this is only a small image within the entire financial picture. The other set of accounting books are known as the financial statements of the CAFR, the AFR, and on a federal level, the CFS. These show a more complete financial condition of the government, which includes all the income generated from government liquid investment funds, bond financing accounts, and corporate stock portfolios. Some examples of these investment centers include self-insurance, enterprise operations, self-debt funding accounts, hundreds if not thousands of specialty funding accounts, creatively enacted advanced for liability accounts, federally funded program accounts, pensions, real estate venture projects, and property seized by the state. When you look into these funds, you find governments have actually been stashing away large surpluses of money from the general public. These funds have been kept away from the taxpayer while taxes are raised and citizens are told to expect fewer services. None of these revenue centers report their income in the general budget, allowing the government to hide how much money they are truly making within each accounting cycle. And, it serves to create a void of comprehension, keeping the public in the dark of what is truly going on. If a private sector business was to adopt these same accounting practices, they would qualify as a criminal enterprise under the RICO statutes for extortion. But the government wiggled around this by passing laws designed to elude all consequences of their theft. Which is another part of the problem. Today, over 70 to 80 percent of all elected officials are associated with the massive attorney network complex, which has since taken over the three branches of the government. These attorneys make laws which give them power to sue anyone who dares to attempt to access these funds. As long as people continue voting these attorneys into office, they will continue stealing these massive profits for themselves. When analyzing the total income generated on a composite level of local, state, and federal government financial statements, the non-disclosed revenues now account for 66% of all the government's income, while the other 33% is still derived from tax revenues. If the government's administrative duties were modified slightly through the creation of tax retirement funds, then the profits generated could easily run all governments without any further need of taxation and still have enough money left over to pay a dividend check to every American. TRF funds would be set up like a pension fund, but with the goal of retiring all forms of taxation. The majority of its investments would be made to local businesses, stimulating their own local economy instead of Wall Street and offshore banks. After auditing and applying surpluses found within the CAFR, most governments have half the funds needed to create a tax retirement fund. The other half could be raised over a five-year period using income generated in various CAFR revenue centers. Eventually, the funds will grow large enough to phase out all taxation, creating thriving local economies and even greater sums of money for all people.
According to the research uncovered by concerned activist Walter Buren, the editor of CAFR1.com website, in 1998, the federal government collected $1.8 trillion in taxes, and all local and state governments collected $1.6 trillion, with total tax revenues of $3.5 trillion. The revenue centers found within the CAFR brought in another $5.1 trillion, with a grand total of $8.5 trillion of gross income for the government. And according to the World Bank, the United States economy generated only $8.7 trillion for that same year. But this statistic is misleading, because the income generated by the government is excluded from the GDP to hide the fact that the government makes more revenue than the general population. If this data was revised to show all private and public sector income, then the total GDP in 1998 would have been $17.2 trillion, with the government accounting for 49% of all economic activity within the United States. By the year 2009, this number has since grown to nearly 70% of all economic activity, leaving little doubt the United States is now a command economy. But even more alarming, these non-disclosed government investment funds have become so massive they now control 60 to 70 percent of all American corporations. Whenever you hear about these so-called institutional investors mentioned in the news media, they are actually referring to a composite of government pension funds and domestic and international specialty funds, which in the year of 2000 accounted for an 82 percent stock ownership of Microsoft, 61 percent of Disney, 58 percent of AOL Time Warner, and 72 percent of Exxon. But of course, the government-owned news media would never dare report these numbers to the American people. With such a large sum of money at their disposal, the stock and bond markets are regularly manipulated, making or breaking any corporation which does not follow the New World Order agenda. No wonder we feel like the stock market is rigged, because it is. This also explains why the government-owned news media will not report anything critical of the government, and also why the government has no intentions of reforming the profitable government-owned healthcare industry. But even more frightening, by using the power of proxy vote, the government can force corporate America to do its own bidding. This explains why we have so much offshoring. Back in the 1960s, most of the businesses owned within the CAFR were primarily restricted to American-owned corporations. But in 1978, the government sidestepped this rule by creating international investment pools which began taking over companies overseas in order to make huge profits from cheaper labor and in turn, putting Americans out of work. Sadly, corporate leaders are powerless to do anything about this lest their companies would be destroyed, or even worse things could happen to them, such as the government firing the entire board of directors and replacing them with their own cronies. Offshoring has allowed these same companies to hide their income from the IRS by setting up domicile corporations throughout the world like in the Cayman Islands. Today, the largest American corporations such as found within the Fortune 500 pay a paltry sum of 0.02% to 1.5% income tax after deductions. Yet the average American is forced to shell out to their slave masters an average of 27% of their personal income tax returns. In addition to offshoring American jobs, the federal and local government has been implicated in using its derivatives to manipulate financial markets throughout the world. According to a March 2008 U.S. Treasury audit of its bank derivative holdings, the government currently holds over $180 trillion of derivatives, most of which is held within the five largest American banks. These credit swap derivatives are used to manipulate all commodity prices, including the short and long-term bond yields. The prices are crude oil, precious metals, and stock certificates, creating easy money for the government, but consequently leading to a speculative global bubble market and its eventual demise. Which seems to be what they want, to drain all the people's assets in a covert and hidden way, while inevitably enhancing the profits of their own investment funds. To correct this problem, a full audit of the government's financial statements must be disclosed to the public. But as long as attorneys continue to monopolize the functions of the government, it is doubtful this will ever happen. While the theft of the people's money continue to impoverish the masses, the lucrative printing presses at the Federal Reserve Bank managed to enslave them, bringing the New World Order one step closer to reality.
Through the magic of fractional reserve banking, the Federal Reserve System can create or destroy money. But because the interest portion of the bank's loaning activity is not issued into the money supply, more and more loans are necessary to continue financing debt and to continue injecting money into the economy, creating a debt bubble that can only grow larger and larger. During this time, physical assets are exchanged as collateral for intangible fiat money, until the day the debt bubble bursts, allowing the bankers to foreclose on the entire world. The Founding Fathers were well aware of this danger, which is why they outlawed the use of privately issued fiat money as according to Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, which mandates debts can only be repaid with gold and silver. In 1971, Nixon illegally stripped all Federal Reserve notes from the gold standard, and ever since, Americans have been using unlawful money. Without the backing of precious metals, these notes would not even be considered money, as money has intrinsic value. Federal Reserve notes are technically certificates of debt, as they can only be issued into the money supply through the loaning activity of fractional reserve banking. The bottom line here is that central banking is an evil cancer. These people are selling us credit they don't have so they can take profits they don't deserve out of our pockets. That's nuts. The United States government is constitutionally charted to print money on the good faith and credit of all of us and not pay interest. Why are we being such fools? Well, unfortunately, if you fight them, you get assassinated. Lincoln and Kennedy were both about to print money and not borrow from the banks. I can't connect those two dots, but I can tell you they're side by side. When you take a closer look at a dollar bill, you see the words, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private but one needs to ask themselves to whom this debt is owed to. The bankers were able to get around the Constitution's restriction of fiat money by using a clause within Section 16 of the Federal Reserve Act, which stipulates that Federal Reserve notes can only be used by Federal Reserve banks. Isn't it amazing that the bankers consider all people who use their privately issued credit to be Federal Reserve banks? And with the Federal Reserve's open checkbook, stock markets can be manipulated, creating even greater sums of money for the bankers. And even worse, they now have the finances to bankroll World War I and World War II, which helped serve as a diversion to keep the public unaware of what was really going on. After the Federal Reserve's takeover of the American monetary system, the bankers could print as much fiat money as they wanted to buy out anyone and anything which opposed the New World Order agenda. Soon, all the major media conglomerates began to fall under their control. According to a report given to Congress in 1917 by Congressman Oscar Calloway, in 1915, J.P. Morgan met with 12 high-ranking news managers to determine the most influential newspapers in America and to figure out how many of them it would take to generally control the policy of the daily press within the United States. After agreeing it would require the control of 25 of the greatest newspapers, J.P. Morgan, the Rothschild family, and J.D. Rockefeller began buying up these papers and replacing them with new editors who would spread their ideas of a one-world government in a post-war world. To help define this new policy, the now elderly Jacob Schiff recruited J.P. Morgan's personal attorney, Elihu Root, and President Wilson's closest advisor, Edward House, to create a front group which in 1921 would become the Council of Foreign Relations. Their ranks soon swelled to over a thousand members, representing the heads of virtually every industrial empire in America. Soon, other groups similar to the CFR were founded in other nations, such as the Bilderberg Group and the Trilateral Commission. Their inner circle of members now conspired to purchase any asset which was not owned by them, and with the Federal Reserve's power of printing, loaning, or withdrawing money, they were able to profit from the artificially created boom and bust cycles caused by the Fed's manipulation of the interest rates, which resulted in either inflation or deflation of the money supply. This is why the stock market crashed in 1929. In the Roaring 20s, the Fed loaned easy money to the public, creating a boom period. But in 1929, these loans were called in, artificially reducing the money supply and forcing people into bankruptcy. However, members of the elite 
were able to get out of the stock market before the crash thanks to an insider tip from Paul Warburg, who served as both chairman of the CFR and advisor to the Federal Reserve. By 1930, the fallout of the Great Depression had begun to spread worldwide, resulting in the bankruptcy of numerous countries, including the United States. In 1933, the 20-year extension of the national debt, which was extended by Woodrow Wilson in exchange for signing the Federal Reserve Act, was now coming due. With little hope this debt could ever be repaid, the United States now faced another looming bankruptcy. Concerned that the dollar would be devalued, Americans began redeeming their Federal Reserve notes for gold and silver. One of the first things the newly elected President Franklin Roosevelt did while in office was to stop the gold redemptions by declaring the Corporation of the United States bankrupt. This occurred on March 9, 1933, with the passage of the Emergency Banking Act, which closed all U.S. banks for four days in order to reorganize the insolvent monetary system. The bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. Let me make it clear that the banks will take care of all needs. On April 5, 1933, President Roosevelt signed into law the Gold Confiscation Act, which allowed the federal government to confiscate all the people's gold. Therefore, the United States must take firmly in its own hands the control of the gold value of our dollar. The Gold Confiscation Act allowed the federal government to confiscate all the people's gold and to remove the gold standard, replacing all currency with legal tender Federal Reserve notes, which could still be redeemed with silver. But in 1968, silver was also removed from circulation, and later, in 1971, the gold window set up at the Bretton Woods Agreement would also be closed. Under the Bretton Woods Agreement, the IMF mandated that the price of gold would be set at a value of $42.22 per ounce of gold. During this time, only foreigners could redeem the United States dollar for gold. But by August 1971, inflation had sent the market price of gold well above the set level, resulting in massive redemptions of gold by foreign creditors who exchanged their devalued dollar for the more valuable gold stored within the United States IMF Trust Fund. I, Richard Milhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office. That I will faithfully execute the office. After President Nixon illegally removed the convertibility of gold and silver from the dollar, Federal Reserve notes have since devalued 81%. After President Roosevelt confiscated the people's gold, he changed the provision within the 1917 Trading with the Enemy Act, which redefined all U.S. citizens as enemies of the state. Thus, the corporate government declared war on its own people. This gave FDR the power to indefinitely maintain a bank holiday, preventing any more redemption of Federal Reserve notes for gold and silver. And even worse, every president since the Roosevelt administration has continued to use the Tradings with the Enemy Act to maintain states of national emergency. Therefore, new conflicts are encouraged to maintain control over the people. This gave President Truman a precedent to sign the National Security Act of 1947, which created a national security state with the establishment of the CIA and NSA. In our courts, we want a government of laws and not of men. In 1935, President Roosevelt signed the Federal Register Act, which gave the President dictatorial powers by allowing him to create any law without consulting Congress by simply publishing them in the Federal Registry. By 1938, the Supreme Court had ratified Roosevelt's emergency banking proclamations, which changed the Constitutional Republic into a legislative democracy. Public law was replaced with public policy and merchant law with admiralty law suspending the Constitution. Legislative language was used which said only the President can declare an end to the emergency, but once in office and made aware of their dictatorial powers. No President since FDR has been willing to declare an end to the emergency and return our country to constitutional law. When the industrial era began, it broke the connection between kinship and trust. And it started treating people as commodities. 
And then we lost sight of our government and we allowed the corporations to buy the government. The United States of America no longer represents we the people. The U.S. Constitution allows for three types of laws. Common law, such as we the people. Contract law, governing contracts and agreements. And admiralty law, which governs naval forces on the high seas using military tribunals instead of the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Only in times of war can the President expand admiralty law within the interior of the United States. This occurred on December 16, 1950, at the beginning of the Korean War, when President Truman declared a national emergency, which continues to this day. At that point, gold French flags of the Commander-in-Chief began to creep up within the courts, public places, and even churches. Because of the 1933 bankruptcy, the government could no longer receive any more loans from the bankers to continue its operations. So they created an ingenious plan. They would borrow against the labor of all 14th Amendment citizens. They did this by creating a foreign situs trust, using your incorporated name and birth certificate as collateral for new loans. Your birth certificate is not owned by you. The original is kept by the government, which proceeds to issue a copy of live birth only. Since the government owns your birth certificate, you are considered an employee of the Corporation of the United States. After the state receives your birth certificate, it is then registered within the U.S. Department of Transportation, who then has the U.S. Treasury issue a bond using your future labor as collateral, which guarantees the Federal Reserve System repayment of the national debt. It is these bonds which allow the government to continue borrowing unlimited money under its full faith and credit scheme. The government then subjected each person to a proportion of the national debt, which today runs around $1 million per American. This money was then deposited into each person's prepaid birth certificate bond, which the bankers fractionally lent upon, manifesting another $9 million out of thin air. This process would then repeat itself to infinity, bringing in a minimum of $10 million to hundreds of millions of dollars or more, depending on how much money the government thinks you will make over your lifetime. But there was one small snag in all this. In order for the government to write checks from your prepaid account, they have to receive permission from you. This occurs when you voluntarily sign a Social Security SS-5 form. This Social Security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. To persuade people to sign this form, the government will dangle insurance and retirement benefits in your face, but fail to inform you of what you are giving up, or rather, what you will become. By receiving Social Security retirement benefits, you are now considered a federal personnel of the government of the United States, which makes you ineligible to challenge the bankruptcy of the United States. And you are no longer considered a state citizen, but a 14th Amendment citizen, subjecting you to the repayment of the national debt. Accessing and using these funds is beyond the scope of this documentary. However, if you'd like to locate your prepaid account number, then look for the money through your birth certificate, or within your IRS individual master file, or the red-colored Q-SIP serial number located on the back side of all recently issued Social Security cards. This will look different than your Social Security number, as it contains one letter and eight numbers. The first letter designates which one of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks that is recording your bond within its commercial book entry system, and the 8-digit number is your account number, which is traded as a stock certificate in either Switzerland or Puerto Rico. After the bankruptcy of the Corporation of the United States in 1933, its assets were placed under the control of the Secretary Treasury as its appointed receiver. And then in 1944, the corporation's assets were quick claimed under the control of the newly created International Monetary Fund. The IMF, along with the World Bank and GATT, were all created in 1944 during the Bretton Woods Agreement. Their policies have allowed the bankers to capture within the United States all its gold, national parks, nonprofit corporations, all property of 14th Amendment citizens, and even the birth certificate bonds. These assets are now managed by the governor of the IMF, who just so happens to be the Secretary of Treasury and a paid employee of the IMF. Today, the IMF, 
holds a 51% ownership over the corporate government, Interpol, and even the Office of Personal Management, which is responsible for sending paychecks to all federal employees. Not only has the IMF gained control over the land and the people of the United States, they managed to steal all its monetary gold under a system of institutionalized inflation created by the Brenton Woods Agreement, which dictated that U.S. tax dollars would finance the construction of factories in foreign lands to compete with American jobs. When this money was being sent overseas, the United States gold reserve shrank from 80% of the world's gold in 1946 to 22% by 1971. This gold ultimately made its way into the banker's personal coffers in mainland Europe. By the 1960s, state governors were becoming concerned of the IMF takeover of the American economy and with the legality of privately issued Federal Reserve notes, which had been declared as unlawful money within their own national and state constitutions. So in 1962, at the National Governors Conference in Lexington, Kentucky, state governors met with IMF leaders to discuss solutions to help mitigate the constitutional crisis at hand. They agreed the best approach was to reincorporate all states under the same jurisdiction of the IMF and to do away with constitutional law and replace it with the tenets of the Uniform Commercial Code and the Code of Federal Regulations, which can only be enforced in administrative tribunals and admiralty law courts. This gave them even more control over the people, because instead of the masses governing themselves within the limits of the law like the Constitution dictates, they would now govern the people under a strict set of codes which can be used for corruption. By 1972, all the states had incorporated these guidelines and ever since, the people lost all constitutional protections. With the help of the Bank of International Settlements, the IMF, and the World Bank, the international bankers had exported the American slave grid to the entire world. In 1945, the United Nations Organization was established in the heart of the British Colony's financial district of New York City. Not only had the Crown of England recaptured her colony, she now had full control over the world's financial system. The corruption of the banks and the federal government had become so pervasive they truly believed themselves to be above the law. In 1963, the CIA murdered John F. Kennedy for attempting to print gold and silver back certificates and for setting up a gold back international reserve currency. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. President Reagan was well aware of what was going on when he was quoted as saying in a 1982 Grace Commission report, none of the federal income tax paid by the American people is ever deposited into the United States Treasury, but instead is deposited into the Federal Reserve Bank for its use and benefit. When President Reagan was elected, one of the first things that he did was appoint a, a blue ribbon panel of, of business people headed by Peter Grace and is commonly referred to as the Grace Commission and they their job was to research uh, all the various areas of the federal government and make a report. One of the quotes from the Grace Commission is 100 percent of what is collected is absorbed solely by interest on the federal debt. All individual income tax revenues are gone before one nickel is spent on the services taxpayers expect from government. I believe that in both spirit and substance our tax system has come to be un-American. Death and taxes may be inevitable, but unjust taxes are not. In 1981, Reagan attempted to place the United States on a gold banking system, but before he could, he was assassinated by John Hinckley, whose family incidentally worked closely together in the oil business with George Bush Sr. After his death, Reagan was replaced with a clone, which continued to serve out the presidency without the public's knowledge. Over the passing years, the Federal Reserve System continued to bury the people with debt. The United States was transformed from a constitutional republic to a debtor's nation, and then to its current form of a legislative democracy controlled by a fascist government, and they did so by transferring all the assets and future assets of the people into the hands of the international bankers. Since the fall of Atlantis, Satan and his minions have been working tirelessly to end all goodness on this planet. But God and the Brotherhood of Light 
have put together their own plan to defeat the dark side. Throughout history, many prophets have come forth to speak of the coming golden age of humanity. This truth was made known only to fall silent on the deaf ears of the ignorant masses. But change is on the horizon. The power grab of the elite is coming to an end. With all their power and money, the bankers thought themselves to be above the law, but cracks were now appearing in their foundations. Angry Americans were beginning to fight back. A class action lawsuit was brewing, which would threaten to change the balance of power. This change began in the mid-1970s, when the Federal Land Bank illegally foreclosed on farmers' mortgages all throughout the Midwest. In each of these cases, the farmers were defrauded by the banks with the approval of the Federal Reserve System. These court cases would eventually become known as the Farmers Claims Program. In 1978, an elderly ranch farmer in Colorado purchased a farm with a loan from the Federal Land Bank. After he died, the property was passed on to his son, Roy Swassinger Jr., who was a retired military general. Soon after, a federal land bank officer and federal marshal appeared on his property and informed him the bank was foreclosing on his farm and to vacate within 30 days. Without his knowledge, his deceased father signed a stipulation which reverted the property back to the federal land bank in the event of the borrower's death. Outrage, Roy Swassinger filed a class action lawsuit in the Denver federal court system. But the case didn't go very far and the suit was dismissed from filing incorrectly. This began Roy Swassinger's investigation into the inner workings of the banking system. In 1982, he was given a contract by the U.S. Senate and later the Supreme Court to investigate banking fraud. But because he was under a strict non-disclosure order, he was not allowed to tell the media what he discovered. In the late 80s, he began sharing his knowledge with others, including high-ranking military personnel, who helped bring about a class action lawsuit against the federal government. The first series of these lawsuits began in the mid-1980s, when William and Shirley Baskerville of Fort Collins, Colorado, were involved in a bankruptcy case with First Interstate Bank of Fort Collins, who was trying to foreclose on their farm. At a restaurant, their lawyer informed him that he would no longer be able to help them and walked off. Overhearing the conversation, Roy Swassinger offered his advice on how to appeal the case in bankruptcy court. So in 1987, they filed an appeal with the United States District Court in Colorado. On November 3, 1988, the Denver Federal Court System ruled that indeed the banks had defrauded the Baskervilles and proceeded to reverse its bankruptcy decision. But when the foreclosed property was not returned, they filed a new lawsuit. Eventually, 23 other farmers, ranchers, and Indians, swindled by the banks in the same manner, would join in the case. In these cases, the banks were foreclosing on the properties using fraudulent methods such as charging exorbitant interest, illegal foreclosure, or by not crediting mortgage payments to their account as they should have, but instead would steal the mortgage payments for themselves, triggering foreclosure on the property. After running out of money, they continue their fight without the help of lawyers. With some assistance by the Farmers Union, a new lawsuit was filed against the Federal Land Bank and the Farmers Credit System. The District Court ruled in their favor and ordered the banks to return the stolen properties with help from either Federal Marshals or the National Guard. But when no payments were made, the farmers declared involuntary Chapter 7 bankruptcy against the Federal Land Bank and the Farmers Credit System. The banks appealed their case, insisting they were not a business, but a federal agency. Therefore, they were not liable to pay the damages. So the farmers' legal team adopted a new strategy. According to the Federal Land Bank's 1933 charter, they are not allowed to make loans directly to applicants, but instead could only back loans as a guarantor in case of default. Because the Federal Land Bank had violated this rule, the farmer's legal team was able to successfully sue the bank for damages. Word of the lawsuit began to spread. The legal team would teach others how to fight foreclosure and to help them file lawsuits as well. Celebrities, such as Willie Nelson, joined in the case and helped raise money during his farm aid concerts. 
Here is a short clip of Willie Nelson describing in his own words the series of events leading up to the Farmers Claims legal case. This whole thing started when agriculture collapsed. He was saying that the right housing, over. The housing thing came second. T tell us about it. Well, you know, I've been in Farm Aid a long time, and yeah. I, I've been seeing exactly 8 million good. family farmers leave the farm. Yep. And uh, there, there was 8 million, and now there's less than 2 million losing three to 500 a week. Yep. The reason they're going is because they're going out and taking the land back, and now they're taking the houses back that they sold. I mean, they told the farmer to plant, you know, fence post to fence post. We'll take care of you, buddy. Loaned him more money than he can pay back. And then he wound up losing his farm. Yep. Same thing happened to the house owner. Loan him more money than he can pay back. Now, the next thing you know, uh, the government's got all the land, all the money, and we just give the asshole six, seven hundred million more, billion more dollars. The Baskerville case had now become the farmer claims class action lawsuit. Worried about the legal ramifications, the government retaliated against the farmers by hitting them with either outrageous IRS fees or by imprisoning the legal team under frivolous, non-related charges. When the farmers realized they were being unfairly targeted, they had military generals, such as General Roy Swassinger, sit in the courtroom to make sure the bribe judges would vote according to constitutional law. The farmers now, with a large team of knowledgeable people with the law behind them, filed a new case to claim additional damages from the fraudulent loaning activities of the farmers' credit system. The government tried to settle, but they had already lost many cases and were now losing the appeals as well. More and more evidence was collected. According to the National Banking Act, all banks were required to register their charters with the Federal and State Bureau records. But none of the banks complied, allowing the legal team to sue the farmer's credit system. Not only was the farmer's credit system not chartered to do business with the American Banking Association, but so were other quasi-government organizations, such as the Federal Housing Administration, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and even the Federal Reserve Bank. The farmers' claim lawsuit was thrown out of court at each level, with the records purposely destroyed. So in the early 1990s, Roy Swassinger brought the case before the United States Supreme Court. Some of the content of this case is sealed from public eyes, but most of it can be viewed today. Almost unanimously, the U.S. Supreme Court justices ruled that the farmers' union claims were indeed valid. Therefore, all property foreclosed by the farmers' credit system was illegal and those who were foreclosed on would have to receive damages. In addition, they ruled that the U.S. federal government and banks had defrauded the farmers and all U.S. citizens out of vast sums of money and property. And furthermore, the court ruled the shocking truth that the IRS was a Puerto Rican trust, that the Federal Reserve was unlawful, that the income tax amendment was only ratified by four states and therefore was not a legal amendment that the IRS code was not enacted into positive law within the code of federal regulations, and how the U.S. government illegally foreclosed on farmers' homes with help from federal agencies. Irrefutable proof was presented by a retired CIA agent. He provided testimony and records of the bank's illegal activities to lead further evidence that the farmer union claims were indeed legitimate. The implications of such a decision were profound. All gold, silver, and property titles taken by the Federal Reserve and IRS must be returned to the people. The legal team sought assistance from a small group of benevolent visionaries consisting of politicians, military generals, and business people who have been secretly working to restore the Constitution since the mid-1950s. Somehow, within their ranks, a four-star U.S. Army general received title and receiver of the original 1933 United States bankruptcy. When the case was brought before the United States Supreme Court, they ruled in his favor, giving the Army general title over the United States Incorporated. Legal action was then passed on to the Senate Finance Committee and Senator Sam Nunn, who was working with Roy Swassinger. I will tell you the price of buying back the United States government. It's $500 million a year. In the early 90s, Newt Gingrich and the Republicans got together. Their plan is now on the street. It's been exposed by a Columbia professor. They concluded that they could buy the United States government from school board to state house to White House for $300 million a year, and by golly, they did. 
With help from covert congressional and political pressure, President George H.W. Bush issued an executive order on October 23, 1991, which provided a provision allowing anyone who has a claim against the federal government to receive a payment as long as it's within the rules of the original format of the case. According to the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, all present and succeeding debts against the U.S. Treasury must be assumed by the Federal Reserve. Thus, the Farmers Legal Team was able to use that executive order to not only force the Federal Reserve to pay out damages in a gold-backed currency, but allow them to receive legal ownership over the bankruptcy of United States Incorporated. To collect damages, the Farmers Legal Team used an obscure attachment to the 14th Amendment which most people are not aware of. After the Civil War, the government allowed citizens to claim a payment on anyone who suffered damages as a result of the federal government failing to protect its citizens from harm or damages by a foreign government. President Grant had this attachment sealed from public eyes, but somehow someone on the Farmers Legal Team got a hold of it. If you listen to that carefully, it specifies damages by a foreign government. That foreign government is the corporate federal government which has been masquerading to the public as a constitutional government. Remember, this goes back to the Organic Act of 1871 and the Trading with the Enemies Act of 1933 which defined all citizens as enemy combatants under the federal system known as the United States. The Justices and Farmers Legal Team recognized how evil and corrupt our federal government had become. And to counteract this, they added some provisions in the settlement to bring the government back under control. First, they would have to be paid using a lawful currency backed by gold and silver as the Constitution dictates. This would eliminate inflation and gyrating economic cycles created by the Federal Reserve System. Second, they would be required to go back to common law instead of admiralty law under the gold French flags. Under common law, if there is no damage done or harm done, then there is no violation of the law. This would eliminate millions of laws which are used to control the masses and protect corrupt politicians. Lastly, the IRS would have to be dismantled and replaced with a national sales tax. This is the basis of the Nassara Law. When the legal team finally settled on a figure, each individual would receive an average of $20 million payout per claim. Multiplied by a total of 336,000 claims that are filed against the U.S. federal government, the total payout will come out to a staggering $6.6 .6 trillion. The U.S. Supreme Court placed a gag order on the case, struck all information from the Federal Registry, and placed all records in the Supreme Court files. Up to that point, Senator Sam Nunn had kept the Baskerville case records within his office. A settlement was agreed to out of court, and the decision was sealed by Janet Reno. Because the case was sealed, claimants are not allowed to share court documents to media outlets without violating the settlement, but they can still tell others about the lawsuit. This is probably why you haven't heard about this. In 1991, General Lloyd Swassinger went before a Senate committee to present evidence of the banks and government's criminal activity. He informed them how the Corporation of the United States was tied to the establishment of a new world order, which would bring about a fascist one world government ruled by the international bankers. So in 1992, a task force was put together consisting of over 300 retired and 35 active U.S. military officers who strongly supported constitutional law. This task force was responsible for investigating government officials, congressional officers, judges, and the Federal Reserve. They uncovered the common practice of bribery and extortion committed by both senators and judges. And every single member of Congress is impeachable for having abdicated their Article I responsibilities under the Constitution and serving as foot soldiers uh, for the President and his mendacious Vice President. The criminal activity was so rampant that only two out of 535 members of Congress were deemed honest. But more importantly, they carried out the first ever audit of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve was used to giving out orders to politicians and had no intentions of being audited. However, after they were informed their offices would be raided under military gunpoint if necessary, they complied with the investigation. After reviewing their files, the military officers found $800 trillion sitting in accounts which should have been applied to the national debt. And contrary to federal government propaganda, they also discovered that most nations had in fact owed money to the United States instead of the other way around. 
These hidden trillions were then confiscated and placed into European bank accounts in order to generate the enormous funds needed to pay the farmer claims class action lawsuit. Later, this money would become the basis of the prosperity programs. Despite these death blows, President George H.W. Bush and the Illuminati continued on with their plans of global enslavement. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. In August 1992, the military officers confronted President Bush and demanded that he sign an agreement that he would return the United States to constitutional law and ordered him to never use the term New World Order again. Bush pretended to cooperate, but secretly planned to bring about the New World Order anyway by signing an executive order on December 25, 1992 that would have indefinitely closed all banks, giving Bush an excuse to declare martial law. Under the chaos of martial law, Bush intended to install a new constitution, which would have kept everyone currently in office in their same position for 25 years, and it would have removed all rights to elect new officials. The military intervened and stopped Bush from signing that executive order. In 1993, members of the Supreme Court, certain members of Congress and representatives from the Clinton government met with high-ranking U.S. military officers who were demanding a return to constitutional law, reforms of the banking system, and financial redress. They agreed to create the farm claims process which would allow the legal team to set up meetings all over the country on a grassroots level to help others file claims and to educate them about the lawsuit. A claim of harm can be made on any loan issued by a financial institution for all interest paid, foreclosures, attorney and court fees, IRS taxes or liens, real estate and property taxes, mental and emotional stress caused by the loss of property, stress-related illnesses such as suicide and divorce, and even warrants, incarceration and probation could also be claimed. But the Clinton government undermined their efforts by requiring the farm claims to use a specific form designed by the government. This form imposed an administrative fee of $300 for each claim, which was later used in 1994 as a basis to arrest the leaders of the legal team, including Roy Swassinger. The government was so afraid of what they would say during their trial in Michigan that extra steps were taken to conceal the true nature of the case. County courthouse employees were not allowed to work between Monday and Thursday during the course of the trial, and outside the courthouse, FBI agents swarmed the perimeter, preventing the media and visitors from learning what was going on as well. Harassment and retaliation by the government increased. Many were sent to prison or murdered while incarcerated. Despite being protected by his military personnel, the Army General, who acquired the original 1933 title of bankruptcy of the United States, was imprisoned, killed, and replaced with a clone. This clone was then used as a decoy to prevent any further claims from being filed. During the first Clinton administration, the military delayed many of Clinton's federal appointments until they were sure these individuals would help restore constitutional law. One such individual who promised to bring about the necessary changes was Attorney General Janet Reno. If Bill and Hillary Clinton come and tell Webb Hubble to tell me to do something wrong, I'm going to say, Webb, I'm not going to do it. In agreement with the Supreme Court ruling on June 3, 1933, Janet Reno ordered the Delta Force and Navy SEALs to Switzerland, England, and Israel to recapture trillions of dollars of gold stolen by the Federal Reserve System from the Strategic Gold Reserves. These nations cooperated with the raid because they were promised their debts owed to the United States would be canceled, and because the people who stole money from the United States also stole money from their nations as well. This bullion is to be used for the new currency backed by precious metals. It is now safely stockpiled at the NORAD complex in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and four other repositories. Janet Reno's actions so enraged the powers that be that it resulted in her death. She was then replaced with a clone, and it was this creature that was responsible for covering up the various Clinton scandals. To keep the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, Robert Rubin, in line, he too was also cloned. For the remainder of their term in office, both Reno and Rubin received their salaries from the International Monetary Fund as foreign agents, and not from the U.S. Treasury. 
Despite these actions, the legal team continued on with their fight while managing to avoid bloodshed in a major revolution. After 1993, the Farmers Claims process name was changed to Bank Claims. Between 1993 and 1996, the U.S. Supreme Court required U.S. citizens to file bank claims to collect damages paid by the U.S. Treasury Department. This process closed in 1996. During this time, the U.S. Supreme Court assigned one or more justices to monitor the progress of the rulings. They enlisted help of experts in economics, monetary systems, banking, constitutional government and law, and many other related areas. These justices built coalitions of support and assistance with thousands of people worldwide known as White Knights. The term White Knights was borrowed from the world of big business. It refers to a vulnerable company that is rescued by a corporation or a wealthy person from a hostile takeover. To implement the required changes, the five justices spent years negotiating how the reformations would occur. Eventually, they settled on certain agreements, also known as accords, with the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve Bank owners, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and with numerous other countries, including the United Kingdom and countries of the Eurozone. Because these banking reformations will impact the entire world, the IMF, World Bank, and other countries had to be involved. The reformations require that the Federal Reserve be absorbed by the U.S. Treasury Department, and the bank's fraudulent activities must be stopped and payment must be made for past harm. In 1998, the military generals who originally participated in the farmer claims process realized that the U.S. Supreme Court justices had no intentions of implementing the accords. So they decided the only way to implement the reformations was through a law passed by Congress. In 1999, a 75-page document known as the National Economic Security and Reformation Act was submitted to Congress where it sat with little action for almost a year. Late one evening, on March 9, 2000, a written quorum call was hand-delivered by Delta Force and Navy SEALs to 15 members of the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House who were sponsors and co-sponsors of NASARA. They were immediately escorted by the Delta Force and Navy SEALs to the respective voting chambers where they passed the National Economic Security and Reformation Act. These 15 members of Congress were the only people lawfully allowed to hold office in accordance with the original 13th Amendment. Remember, British soldiers destroyed copies of the Titles and Nobility Amendment in the War of 1812 because it prevented anyone who had ties to the Crown of England from holding public office. Nassara is the most groundbreaking reformation to sweep not only this country, but our planet in its entire history. The act does away with the Federal Reserve Bank, the IRS, the shadow government, and much, much more. Nassara implements the following changes. Zeroes out all credit card, mortgage, and other bank debt due to illegal banking and government activities. This is the Federal Reserve's worst nightmare, a jubilee or a forgiveness of debt abolishes the income tax, abolishes the IRS. Employees of the IRS will be transferred into the U.S. Treasury National Sales Tax Area, creates a 14% flat rate non-essential new items only sales tax revenue for the government. In other words, food and medicine will not be taxed, nor will used items such as old homes. Increases benefits to senior citizens, returns constitutional law to all courts and legal matters, reinstates the original title of nobility amendment, Hundreds of thousands of Americans under the control of foreign powers will lose their citizenship, be deported to other countries, and barred from re-entry for the remainder of their life, and millions of people will soon discover their college degrees are now worthless paper. Establishes new presidential and congressional elections within 120 days after Nassar's announcement, the interim government will cancel all national emergencies and return us back to constitutional law monitors elections and prevents illegal election activities of special interest groups, creates a new U.S. Treasury rainbow currency backed by gold, silver, and platinum precious metals, ending the bankruptcy of the United States, initiated by Franklin Roosevelt in 1933, forbids the sale of American birth certificate records as chattel property bonds by the U.S. Department of Transportation, initiates new U.S. Treasury bank system in alignment with constitutional law, eliminates the Federal Reserve System. During the transition period, the Federal Reserve will be allowed to operate side-by-side side of the U.S. Treasury for one year in order to remove all Federal Reserve notes from the money supply, restores financial privacy, 
retrains all judges and attorneys in constitutional law, ceases all aggressive U.S. government military actions worldwide, establishes peace throughout the world, releases enormous sums of money for humanitarian purposes, enables the release over 6,000 patents of suppressed technologies that are being withheld from the public under the guise of national security, including free energy devices, anti-gravity, and sonic healing machines. I want the American people to know today that I am still committed to working with people of good faith and goodwill of both parties to do what's best for our country. Because President Clinton's clone had no interest in signing Nassar into law on October 10, 2000, under orders from U.S. military generals, the elite Naval SEALs and Delta Force stormed the White House and under gunpoint forced Bill Clinton to sign Nassar into law. During this time, Secret Service and White House security personnel were ordered to stand down, disarmed, and allowed to witness this event under a gag order. From its very inception, Bush Sr., the corporate government, major bank houses in the Carlyle Group have opposed Nassara. To maintain secrecy, the case details and the docket number were sealed and revised within the official congressional registry to reflect a commemorative coin, and then again, it was revised even more recently. This is why there are no public congressional records and why a search for this law will not yield the correct details until after the reformations are made public. You probably never heard of this law due to an extremely strict gag order placed upon politicians, media personnel, and bank officers. Even though Alex Jones or Ron Paul will not tell you about it, the law is still valid. And members of Congress will not tell us any of this because they have been ordered by the U.S. Supreme Court justices to deny the existence of Nassara or face charges of treason punishable by death. Some members of Congress have actually been charged with obstruction. We're here to the nation's capital to tell the story that we've got an economic convulsion in agriculture. We've got a lot of broken dreams, a lot of broken lives, a lot of broken families, and we're not going to take it any longer. Minnesota Senator Paul Wellstone was about to break the gag order, but before he could, his small passenger plane crashed, killing his wife, daughter, and himself. If fear isn't enough to keep Congress in line, money is. The CIA routinely bribed senators with stolen loot from the bank roll programs. Every senator has been bribed with a minimum of $200 million deposited into a Bank of America account in Canada. You would never hear the media networks report about Nassara. To maintain silence, major news networks such as CNN are paid in the tune of $2 billion annually. Some of this loot is funneled by the Mormon Church in Utah through Senator Orrin Hatch's office in Bank of America. Not only is Congress bribed, but the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff and the upper tier of the government, including the President himself, receives these payments as well. Only the Provost Marshal has the lawful authority to arrest these individuals, but sadly, he won't do his job either. It seems the United States military is full of pencil-pushing politicians who care more about advancement than doing their job. And not surprisingly, much disinformation about Nassara can be found on the internet. Prominent naysayers include Quatlus.com, which is rumored to be a CIA front, Nassara.org, which is maintained by the Bush family, Sherry Schreiner, and various internet channelers receiving their messages from telepathic spooks have all contributed to the confusion. Even the information on Wikipedia is in error. Wikipedia gives you the history of CIA agent Harvey Bernard's Nassara Law. If you look closely, this law stands for the National Economic Stabilization and Recovery Act, which would have made reforms to the economy and replaced the income tax with a national sales tax. This law was rejected by Congress in the 1990s. But there's little mention of the National Economic Security and Reformation Act on Wikipedia or its ramifications. The next step is to announce Nassar to the world, but it's not an easy task to do. Many powerful groups have tried to prevent the implementation of Nassara. The Nassara law requires that at least once a year, an effort be made to announce the law to the public. Three current U.S. Supreme Court judges control the committee in charge of Nassara's announcement. These judges have used their overall authority to secretly sabotage Nassara's announcement. In 2001, after much negotiation, the Supreme Court justices ordered the current Congress to pass resolutions approving Nassara. This took place on September 9, 2001, 18 months after Nassara became law. On September 10, 2001, 
George Bush Sr. moved into the White House to steer his son on how to block the announcement. The next day, on September 11, 2001, at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Alan Greenspan was scheduled to announce the new U.S. Treasury Bank System, debt forgiveness for all U.S. citizens, and abolishment of the IRS as the first part of the public announcements of Nassara. Just before the announcement at 9 a.m., Bush Sr. ordered the demolition of the World Trade Center to stop the international banking computers on floors 1 and 2 in the North Tower from initiating the new U.S. Treasury Bank System. Explosives in the World Trade Center were planted by both CIA and Mossad operatives and detonated remotely in Building 7, which was demolished later that day in order to cover up their crime. Remote pilot technology was used in a flyer event to deliver a payload of explosives into the Pentagon at the exact location of the White Knights and their new Naval Command Center who were coordinating activities supporting Nassara's implementation nationwide. With the announcement Nassara stopped dead in his tracks, George Bush Sr. decapitated any hopes of returning the government back to the people. While CIA agent Osama bin Laden is made into the boogeyman, the country dashed off to fight a war on terror. The events of 9-11 eventually led way to the slaughter of the Iraqi people. To keep the public unaware of the carnage, the official death count of U.S. soldier and Iraqi civilians is purposely underreported. Deceased U.S. soldiers are either being dumped into the Persian Gulf or replaced with clones. As of 2009, the total death count of Iraqi civilians now surpasses a staggering 1.6 million people. The same Cook statistics apply to the death totals on the day of 9-11. According to the government, 2,752 people died that day, when in actuality, 30,700 people had died. No one questions the insanely small numbers given out by the government because New York City is a large place. People who have lost loved ones do not make contact with other survivors, so they have no way of knowing how many people have truly died. The Bush family was originally offered $300 trillion to cooperate with Nassara, but instead, they chose to maintain their control over us, so in the end, the Bush family will end up with nothing. The attacks of 9-11 had managed to stop the announcement of Nassara dead in its tracks. Many more attempts have been made over the years, but the Bush family has managed to stop them. These people won't be able to get away with their crimes forever. Little by little, their wealth is being dismantled right before their eyes. Before Nassara is announced to the public, it was stipulated that the original farmer claims must be paid out with a bullion-backed currency issued by the U.S. Treasury. In other words, they cannot be paid in Federal Reserve notes. The $6.6 trillion farmer claims payout is to be distributed in the form of ATM debit cards. Remember, this money will come from the bank roll in prosperity programs. The only catch is, to distribute these funds, they must first be released by the trustees, whose members come from the Clinton, Bush, and Rockefeller families. They are doing everything they possibly can to stop these payouts. One way is to transport the banking documents, which contain instructions on how to access these funds in a never-ending loop, 24-7, between warehouses in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Washington, D.C. The drivers of these FedEx trucks are heavily bribed and many of them are afraid of being arrested by the Department of Homeland Security if they were to actually deliver their payload as required by law. At one point, after the packets were returned to Washington, D.C., President George W. Bush placed them under military guard. Federal judges ordered him to release the funds, but Bush replied, You will never receive these packages. They belong to me. The judge answered, I can do no more. He is the President of the United States. 
The only option left is to arrest the president, but the police commissioner, provost marshal, and the military refuse to help. This cycle has been ongoing for years. The only alternative left is to kill the Federal Reserve System by force. The problem is, George Bush, and now Obama, has threatened to use the dollar as a weapon of mass destruction against the nations of the world to comply with the New World Order agenda. Bush once commented, The people will now suffer greatly. The world cannot tolerate this. The dollar must be removed as an international reserve currency and replaced with a new independent asset-based monetary unit backed by precious metals. On December 15, 2006, a meeting was arranged to discuss ways to curtail these criminal activities. Their ranks included representatives from the global family who were enlightened individuals working directly under St. Germain. They include members from the IMF, World Bank, Rothschild family, and key persons from over 48 nations. They agreed to implement three goals by June 15, 2007, that is, to end all war, to actively improve the environment, to actively provide abundance for their people. Those nations which do not keep this agreement will eventually be cut off from the international banking community in order to force them into compliance. On September 19, 2007, a new gold-backed banking system was approved by Congress. On October 19, 2007, at midnight, the U.S. Treasury of the Republic went online with a new global banking system. But this gold banking system is not being deployed because the banks are trying to depose of their worthless derivatives before they get reset to zero when the new gold-backed currency valuations go into force. To improve the stability of the banking system, in 1988, the Bank of International Settlements implemented Basel I, which required banks to hold 6% net capital. On December 1, 2007, this went a step further when Basel II was implemented, requiring all loans to be backed by the appropriate collateral and raise net capital requirements to 8%. The new rules prevent the bankers from collateralizing their derivatives with stolen money from their collateral accounts and prosperity funds. Furthermore, all assets must be valued according to the daily market price, also known as the mark-to-market rule. Any bank which refuses to comply with Basel II will be cut off from international markets, which is why American banks demanded $700 billion from the Trouble Asset Relief Program. If they didn't get this bailout, the banks would have shut their doors, inciting martial law. On June 15, 2009, Basel III was initiated, which goes a step further than Basel II, by requiring the banks to disclose any previously undisclosed junk asset or derivative parked off the balance sheet. Jack Blum has investigated financial fraud for the federal government for over 30 years. He has found that the banks use off-balance sheet financial operations to hide money in places like the Cayman Islands. Uh, if a bank, for example, has done bad lending and they put it in the uh, portfolio of an offshore entity, no one will be able to figure out what that offshore entity is really worth. And it's that kind of transaction that has absolutely disabled the world financial system. I think every bank at this point should be forced to come absolutely clean about how much money it has in these offshore shells of different kinds and how many deals there are hidden in the balance sheet and on the books. Under Basel III, every bank transaction must be disclosed on the balance sheet. But if this was to happen, these banks would become insolvent overnight and would not be able to pass their fake stress test. The Federal Reserve System is fighting tooth and nail to prevent this disclosure because if their $500 trillion or so of derivatives were actually placed on their balance sheet using the mark-to-market rule, they would be shown to be bankrupt. Some banks are now working to bring about the Nassara mission in the hopes that some of the prosperity funds would trickle into their banks, saving them from closing their doors. But most of the larger banks that are fighting the coming changes will soon be out of business. They are not informing their employees of the new regulations and thus will not be ready to operate under a gold banking charter. Slowly, the illegal practices of the international financiers are coming to an end. One by one, the major banking houses are imploding right before our eyes. Their train wreck is occurring because these banks are no longer allowed to use assets from the collateral accounts of the global debt facility to back up their loans. This is why we are seeing the derivatives implode.
The banks have been illegally using the collateral accounts as collateral for their gold-backed derivatives, bullion certificates, and bonds sold through offshore domiciled corporations. With the new Basel II rules in place, these paper assets have now become worthless garbage, resulting in the massive banking write-downs you see today. According to the Office of International Treasury Control, this over-the-counter derivative market is worth about $3.3 quadrillion, with JP Morgan leading the pack with hundreds of trillions of dollars of derivatives. During the Clinton years, the banking 1 to 10 fractional reserve ratio was increased to 1 to 100. This easy money allowed anyone to get a home loan resulting in the housing sector boom. Since many of these loans were made to risky low-income households, the banks deferred their risk by selling their loan portfolios to investors in a process known as securitization. This occurs when mortgages are repackaged with other mortgages in a giant pool of liquidity which are sold to investors on the global market. These credit derivatives can then be repackaged and leveraged again at another 1 to 100 ratio which is then repeated over and over until there is literally quadrillions of dollars of derivatives floating around in the world's banking system. When housing prices were going up, these derivatives were making fortunes for the banks and the government's offshore accounts, allowing them to buy up assets all over the world with virtually free money. When investors realized these derivatives contained toxic loans, they stopped their buying binge, causing the credit market to seize up, which is why housing prices are in freefall. Because no one wants to buy these toxic derivatives, the banks and government are now in a panic to find other people's money to plug up the holes in their cracking dam. Though some funds have been raised by either selling military secrets to China or through CIA drug running operations, this is nowhere near enough money to prop up a collapsing derivative market. So now, the government is resorting to stealing the money, which is no credible way to run a country. To put a stop to this criminal activity, in December 2009, Interpol was given legal jurisdiction within the US to hunt down and arrest corrupt bankers. April 4, 2008 marked the expiration of the 70-year bankruptcy agreement of the United States beginning in 1938. Technically, the bankruptcy began in 1933, but the Supreme Court did not enforce it until the United States became a legislative democracy in 1938. The nations of the world, weary of the shenanigans of the Federal Reserve System, knew they had a limited time to foreclose on the United States before the corporate government could extend another 70-year extension of the bankruptcy. Without this protection, the government was now at the mercy of its creditors, who were demanding reforms of the banking system, such as higher net capital requirements found under Basel II. If the United States failed to meet their demands, they would be cut off from international markets. So to raise the funds needed, in August 2008, the U.S. government began shorting the derivative market, causing stock and commodity prices to fall worldwide. But this $20 trillion of wealth was not destroyed. Instead, it was transferred into the government's offshore pension fund accounts, of which $5 trillion was moved back into the United States to shore up a collapsing dollar. Soon, this money will run out, leaving the option of either crashing the financial markets once again, destroying what little is left of the American economy, or by printing more money, leading to hyperinflation. But the global family does not want to see a devalued dollar, as 90% of all US dollars in circulation today are held by foreigners, and they have no desire to see their assets evaporate. So they have agreed to back all dollars printed before September 2008 with gold stored in the Philippines at a rate of 1 28th of a gram of gold per dollar. This would serve to curb the inflationary activities of the Federal Reserve and the assets of the hard-working average American. But on the other hand, all derivatives will be valued at one-third of 1%, 1 which is their fair market value, forcing those who own this toxic trash into bankruptcy and finally out of business. On September 30th, 2009, the fiscal year of the United States came to a close. Because of the precarious financial situation of the United States and its derivative holdings, the Chinese government reversed its policy of accepting fiat money for repayment of the national debt. So instead, they will only accept gold and silver as lawful payment, as specified in Article 1, Section 10 of the United States Constitution. 
To meet these new demands, the owners of the Federal Reserve System are scrambling to purchase enough gold and silver, but no one wants to sell them any. While the Federal Reserve System is falling apart, Barry Cerrito continues to block the Nassara deliveries. Even though he never invested any money in these programs, he demands a portion of these funds for himself. In a pattern which mimics the Bush years, the Obama administration continues to make numerous daily attempts to steal the funds. But before he was even sworn in office, in December 2008, Obama tried unsuccessfully to steal $400 billion from the prosperity funds and demanded another $1 trillion ransom for his deed. A week before his inauguration, St. Germain and the global family had confronted Obama about his actions. At that time, Obama agreed to go along with the Nassara mission but soon after reversed his promise and has now solidified his alliance with the Bush-Clinton cabal. Our economy is badly weakened, a consequence of greed and irresponsibility on the part of some, but also our collective failure to make hard choices and prepare the nation for a new age. In March 2009, Obama tried once again to steal over $200 trillion of international funds from the Bank of International Settlements. This money was originally stolen by the Nazis from Holocaust victims and for the past 60 years have been earning interest in secret bank accounts. When Obama was informed that the theft of the international funds was an impeachable offense, he replied, You can't touch me. I'm above it. We knew where it was, so we took it. As the largest holder of the national debt, the Chinese government is now in control of the United States economy, its grain supply, and its communist president, which is why Chinese President Hu does not want to see Nassara announced. Otherwise, it would negate this cushy arrangement. In May 2009, Obama sought help from the Chinese government to hack into some of the trust accounts overseas. Had Obama been successful, China would have received a $4 trillion payout for the cooperation. Thankfully, the White Knights located the money and is now in a safe place. So who is really benefiting from a Chicago Olympics? Well, Valerie Jarrett's former businesses uh, benefit, Habitat, which uh, manages uh, hundreds and thousands of apartments throughout Chicago, not only on behalf of the government, on, but on behalf of other developers. In anticipation of the proposed Chicago Olympics site, Obama had committed to buy several hundred million dollars of property in the surrounding area with borrowed money from the U.S. Treasury. He then promised to pay a huge bribe to the International Olympic Committee using stolen money from the prosperity funds. When he arrived empty-handed after failing to access the accounts, they immediately threw out Chicago out of the running and now Obama is stuck with a bunch of worthless slumland and a huge debt to the U.S. Treasury. In another incident, Obama demanded 58% of the program money to be paid to him in his personal bank account, with the rest of the money to be taxed at a rate of 65%. Both the Queen of England, President of France Nicolas Sarkozy, and German Chancellor Angela Merkel agreed to these terms. And why not? After all, it's not their money they're giving away. The Queen of England has also participated in this sabotage. She has placed secret override codes into these banking computers, which allow her ladyship and Obama to move this money around and around until hell freezes over, awaiting the time until they can figure out how to access these funds. To garner the cooperation of Bush Sr. and Obama, the Global Family offered to pay 0.5% for all their fraudulent derivatives and warehouses of stolen loot in exchange for the new gold-backed U.S. Treasury currency. This offer was turned down and a new offer was made at 2.5% with Obama getting 2.5% of that. Even though these percentages may appear to be small, they are based on quadrillions of dollars, so we are talking enormous amounts of money. This offer was also refused, and now they are demanding a 100% exchange along with agreement to escape exposure and prosecution. This offer was flatly turned down. I didn't choose to tackle this issue to get some legislative victory under my belt. And by now, it should be fairly obvious that I didn't take on health care because it was good politics. <laughs> to pay for the United States health care bill, Obama attempted to raise $44.5 trillion through the sale of a health care revenue anticipation bond in Switzerland with a 35-year term collateralized by the Freedom Bankroll Program. Of this, $42 trillion was to go to Obama personally, and the other $2.5 trillion will pay for the government's takeover of health care. 
The only problem is, Obama had the signatures forged, along with a few senior Democratic senators and congressmen who are now demanding his impeachment. When Swiss authorities realized the signatures were forged, they proceeded to turn over the evidence to the International Court of Justice. Obama tried to block this action through an executive order, but no one seems to be paying it much attention. Gotcha. The reason Obama wanted $42 trillion is because he has been borrowing money heavily from the banks in order to bribe anyone who dares to oppose him. These loans are collateralized using forged signatures of prosperity program recipients in their corresponding bank trades. This loan money is then used to bribe world court judges to look the other way. But because the white knights are blocking these transactions, Obama is going deeper and deeper into debt. The banks are starting to realize a trap is being set for them, but sadly, it's too late. There is no way they can recover from these mega loan losses. They may think they can simply destroy evidence of these transactions and hope the problem goes away, but luckily, duplicates can be found through state auditors. When Obama is confronted with these criminal actions, his typical response is, as long as I am the president, which will be for another 12 or 18 years or whatever I decide because I am the ruler, you will never get this money and eventually I will get all of it, one way or another. When referring to the American people, Obama was quoted as saying, they are scum and trash and they do not need or deserve this money. One source is even quoting him as saying, I am king, I am God. Obama's arrogance may stem from the plans of George Bush Sr. and the Thule Society to crown Obama as a God King under a thousand year Reich beginning in 2012. For these reasons, the White Knights have ordered Obama to submit his resignation papers if he wishes to avoid treason. But Obama simply laughs it off and replies, You can't charge me. Besides, the House and Senate will never go along with it because they are just as guilty as I am. He then continues to insist the funds are his to do as he pleases, as he is the ruler of this country. The longer Obama remains in office, the closer America teeters on economic collapse. Personal income tax collections are down 40%, and for corporations, 67%. Housing values have dropped 80% in some areas. Farmers are having a hard time getting a loan to plant new crops, which means many innocent people could pay with their lives. While the United States economy implodes, the government continues to borrow trillions of dollars to fund pet projects and bail out failed business models such as GM and Chrysler. The government debts generated from these bailouts are flooding the bond market, making it even harder for the private sector to get a loan to survive. These actions are also hyperinflationary, which would ultimately lead to a collapsing dollar and higher prices for Americans. The banks now fresh with slush money from their bailouts and bonuses could care less if the economy comes crashing down. In December 2008, access to credit card lines was reduced from $5 trillion to $3 trillion. Sadly, this lifeline is being cut off from the American people at a time when they are losing their jobs. In preparation for economic collapse in the New World Order, Obama has now increased preparedness for martial law which under Rex 84 would send millions of patriotic Americans to concentration camps. Should this occur, the White Knights are prepared to take strong actions to protect the American people. Whether the Nasara transition is peaceful or not, God has mandated the common man will not suffer. The Dark Side's plans for mass vaccinations, martial law, or nuclear war will end in utter failure, and those who cooperated with such schemes would descend into the ash heap of history. The peoples of the world are now becoming aware of these grievances. Queen Elizabeth and the Crown of England have both gone too far with their crown power. Third world nations such as Malaysia would no longer allow the International Monetary Fund to rape their assets. African and South American nations, once devastated by the IMF, are now teaming up to create their own coalitions. Attempts by the international banking community to crush the Islamic nations have yielded little results as they continue to abide to the gold standard as dictated in the Quran. China is proposing the creation of a new international reserve currency backed by precious metals, which would operate outside the manipulations of the Bank of International Settlements and the Committee of 300. In addition to the financial reforms, the Vatican has agreed to cooperate with a plan to end poverty and turn the deserts green by allowing the development of forbidden technologies such as free energy. 
the White Hats and the U.S. Space Command, which operate bases like Area 51, are now ready to release anti-gravity and teleportation technologies, which would make all automobiles and airplanes obsolete. Industries which are expected to vanish completely include petroleum, war, nuclear power, pharmaceuticals, and automobiles. Companies in these industries will receive substantial financial help after NASARA in order to transform themselves for the coming changes. For example, the petroleum industry could be turned into a geoengineering industry, the armaments industry could move into space exploration, and car manufacturers could be retooled to produce anti-gravity scooters. The longer these bankers and the corporate federal government refuse to go along with NASARA, the more banking implosions we will see. The world has announced, enough is enough. If you do not behave yourselves, you will be shut off from the international community. Nearly 300 years have passed since the creation of St. Germain's World Trust. The time has now come to herald in a new age of peace and prosperity. We do not want an economic collapse, martial law, or new world order. We want Nassara now. That's why we are here.